have uh, uh, all of our councillors except uh, Scott Ohm with us today. We have Councillor Nostler Beck with us joining us online, but uh, I think Mr. Ohm hopefully will be here shortly. Uh, we, will, we will start our meeting as we generally do um, with uh, public comment on any item on the agenda. But I'm going to hold for a second. We have some feedback going on in somewhere in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, we'll be. Um, we'll get our audio squared away here in just a second. Okay. Sound okay? You can, you can hear me? Okay, good. So, thank you. Uh, we will st start our meeting with public comment on uh, items that are on the agenda. And our first speaker is uh, Kia Roo and John McMillan on deck. Oh, yes, if you'd come to the podium and uh, if you'd give us your first name and last name, spell your last name and an address, you'll okay. be uh, ready to roll. Uh, good evening, Mayor Starker, city council members, city staff, and city leadership. My name is Kia Roo Reese, last name is R U I Z. 10259 West 72nd Place in Arvada. I'm here today to talk about, um, to reach you all before you do your study session on affordable housing. My children, they attend Mountain Phoenix Community School in Wheat Ridge, and it's at the corridor of I-70 in Kipling. Uh, for some of you may know, this is kind of a problem area. It's across the street from Fruitdale Park, and it's in the area with nine motels. And I'd say like um, the children and the adults have increasingly been exposed to people in mental health crises. We've been finding uh, illicit drug paraphernalia, freebasing material, IV drug use material. We've been seeing a lot of law enforcement looking like better sweets. Um, but it's the sad realities of this humanitarian economic crisis that we're all having to face right now. So my public comment to you all is as you go into your study session, uh, please consider looking at it with a multi-department approach. That's one thing I've reached out to some of you in city leadership about. I want to know what the multi-department approach is because siloing it towards one department that's under-resourced, expecting them to solve everything isn't really going to help out. I know the city did a proclamation for affordable housing awareness in 2018. I don't know how much traction has gone forward. I don't know um, what tonight's specifics are about, if it's about professionals that can't afford to live in the area or people unhoused and in crises, um, but these are all interconnected. And if you can find how the interconnection also goes with all these departments, that can be very helpful. And I know that area also overlaps with Arvada PD, and Jeffco also has uh, people out there. So just consider that. And when I ask for that, uh, when I talk to city leadership and I say, what's the multi-department approach? I would love to hear how you're all coordinating and potentially even see a Venn diagram or something like a flow chart to know how you're all trying to work together instead of just pointing towards the homeless advocate and saying, this under-resourced person has it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is John McMillan, and uh, s no, you can take it off, please, at the, at the podium. John, Mc uh, John McMillan and uh, Susan McMillan on deck. Hello, my name is John McMillan. As most of you know, Susan and I live on a property that some have called non-conforming. I'll be speaking tonight about agenda item two, and particularly the addendum one concerning non-conforming properties. In question is the barn and carriage house that sits on the hill above Everett School on 38th Avenue. Near, after 20 years there, we still love the property, but uncertainties about its legality and its future make it hard to accurately appraise its value and confidently plan for our future. We're different from almost every other property owner and developer who comes before you because we're not asking to build anything or expand anything or even demolish anything. We're only trying to ratify the status quo on our property as built at the present time as allowed by the zoning in place. We're asking for full R2 rights, not an ADU. That's the case, I think, with most of these non-conforming properties. Owners just want to normalize their situation and avoid uncertainties. So these cases shouldn't bring the same level of uncertainty and newness to you and controversy as the ADU and SDR issues, STR issues, which do alter current living and development patterns. Therefore, I'd encourage you to consider setting aside the non-conforming issue for prompt action before you dig into the more complex implications of ADUs. It's really a separate issue with some overlap. The non-conforming 
research criteria given in the staff me memo, addendum one, looks workable and fair. I'd also ask that you consider the eight standard zoning criteria used in zoning, judging rezonings. In our case, our use of the property was compliant with all of these. The lot is big enough with enough parking and separation from neighbors to hold a duplex or more. If the city recognized it as a, a duplex but detached, it would be completely compliant with our two criteria. We're speaking tonight to defend our family home where we've lived a third of our lives. It's our largest investment and asset as we face retirement. That's the stakes for us. But I'm also speaking to defend historic property. This is one of Wheat Ridge's original homestead grants, part of five acres that ran all the way down to the creek in 1896. There's been a lot of history passed through here. From 1940 to 1980, this was home to a local veterinarian whose clinic was in the barn. His son went off to Italy and died fighting flying a fighter plane in World War II. I still have their letters. Doc Cooley was a Jeffco commissioner when he held a secret meeting in the barn with the school board conducting official business. The Sentinel newspaper published an expose that became part of the case for the Colorado Sunshine Law. In the 90s, the barn was and property were home to a successful local artist, Tom Taylor, who kept his painting studio. There's a good case for historic designation here. And I'd rather see that than wholesale redevelopment. This property is a distinctive and familiar local landmark, and I'm intending to preserve it from redevelopment. However, if my acre can accommodate no more than one small dwelling, a thousand square foot farmhouse that has not been challenged, it would no longer be economically viable to keep it as it is for long. In general, what makes cities and old buildings viable is to gradually change, adopt, and grow to meet new needs and circumstances. Yes, our barn was converted into a residence over time by other people in the same way that the entire city has been gradually converted from a farmland to a suburb. We'll never be a clan, planned community of utter uniformity. Better that we be what we are, a hybrid residential community with rural roots, with diverse but well-regulated buildings and dwellings. Please move ahead with a non-conforming process that favors these values. Thank you. Thank you. And, I, and our next speaker is Susan Diller. And uh, I failed to mention that the, you have three minutes for your presentation. And the, let's see, the green light goes on when you start after you've introduced yourself. And uh, I think it, uh, it starts to flash at 30 seconds. And at 15, it goes to orange. And when it turns red, time to wrap it up. I should stop. Thanks so well, much. <clears throat> John told a good part of the story. I'm Susan McMillan at the same address, 9801 West 38th Avenue. And I just wanted to comment a little bit on the emotional impact of what happened to us uh, because we're very happy to see you uh, considering this code change, um, putting this process in place for non-conforming properties. We lived, we, we moved into this particular property in 2000 and we uh, live in the barn, we rent out the farmhouse this arrangement was very happy for everyone involved. We did it very openly until 2017 uh, when there was a big hailstorm and we applied for a building permit uh, to replace the roofs on both houses. And the response to our, in addition to the building permit, was a letter from the city giving us 60 days to subdivide or evict from the property. Um, we protested and the response was uh, direct letters from me several members of council as well as the mayor uh, ordering us to vacate our property immediately. Uh, when we looked at the possibility of subdivision, the cost of subdivision exceeded the value that the increase uh, that the subdivision would bring and it was very expensive, in excess of $100,000. And uh, at that time, our daughter was about to go off to college. We were forced to make the decision, do we try to subdivide, do we send our daughter to college? Very, very stressful. Uh, we did get a lawyer. The lawyer uh, worked on our behalf to try and uh, adjudicate our case, get some sort of waiver. Um, we were met with a lot of false accusations from uh, council, which we were able, later able to refute. We were accused of doing all kinds of illegal development. None of that was true. Uh, we submitted to an inspection by the city building department. 
uh, health and safety inspection, they found no violations, no problems with health and safety. And in fact, they found the building permits for most of the work we had, had done already taped to the equipment that we had had installed. So uh, that uh, disputed much of what they had claimed. However, after that inspection, the city went dark. We never heard what the result was. We never had any process to move forward. And uh, we've been working with new council members. Um, we're very happy to see you get to this point. This was a very painful experience for us, emotionally and financially stressful. Uh, we need to do some expensive maintenance on the house, which we are hesitant to do until we know whether we're going to have to evict from the property or be able to legalize. So we applaud your efforts, your study, um, and encourage you to move forward on this so other Wheat Ridge residents don't have to go what we went through as things change, as they inevitably do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, those are all of the speakers that I have signed up to speak. Is there anyone here who was not able to sign up who would like to speak uh, on an item on tonight's agenda? You may do so now, and I'm going to go and see if there's anyone online in our Zoom format. If you uh, would like to speak on any item, please raise your hand. We'll bring you into the meeting. And I'll uh, look to the clerk and see, do we have anyone, uh, anyone with their hands raised online? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Then we'll uh, close our citizens' right to speak. And we will go to our first item, which is uh, number one, an affordable housing. And I will go to Mr. Mr. Goff. Do you have a? We have a presentation on this one. Too. We do. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this item was was brought forward by Council Members Hoppy and Nosler Beck. And um, if you remember, this was on a, an agenda several a couple of months ago, I believe, and we went late on some other items. And um, this was too important to um, do at uh, late hours, so. We rescheduled, and, and uh, Susan Powers was, was kind enough to come back. And so Susan Powers is here this evening. She's president of Urban Ventures. Um, they, Urban Ventures offers a variety of consulting services in real estate and community development. Urban Ventures focuses on healthy places, resilient communities, affordable housing, and adaptive reuse, and is deeply committed to building quality projects that address the rising demands of affordable housing. So with that, I will turn it over to Susan. She does have a PowerPoint presentation. And do you want to stand or sit? What, what, do you want to stand? You bet. Stand, yep. at, stand at the podium, certainly. Make sure it's all fired up here for you. And you can advance this if you'd like. Or... Thank you very much. for the invitation to be here tonight. Is that working? Yeah, I mean, I, it's yeah. loud enough, right? Yeah. Um, I'm probably not gonna tell you 100, 100 things that you don't already know tonight, so, but I think it's a, it's a good thing to be reminded of what's going on in the market these days and, and, and the impact that the increasing costs are having on people that live in your community. Um, I've, I've worked primarily in, in Denver and I can tell you that the issues there, I mean, they're the same everywhere. I'm doing some work on a project in Pueblo, and um, while they're not as, as bad there because costs are not as high, they still have a, an, an issue with affordable housing. So this is, you're, you're not alone here, but it doesn't make you feel any better because you're hearing from your, from your constituents and your friends and your relatives and the kids of your friends um, who can't afford to live in the town they were born in. And that's, that's, uh, that's certainly the situation I'm sure that you're, that you're de dealing with here. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of run through um, a little bit about the situation as far as we know, and that I know in terms of what's going on in Jefferson County. Um, and we don't have Wheat Ridge specific information where we have that, um, we've included it in here. But if you look at, at the average rent that lower income households can afford, 
Um, these are just, and I, I like to look to make sure that I that always put the income in. And if you took, take that income of $25,000 and you divide that in half and you take a couple digits off, it's the hourly rate. So this is, this is minimum wage. Is someone who earns $25,000 a year, they're, they're in a minimum wage job. And that allows them to, to afford a $641 a month rent. Um, I'm gonna talk about home ownership as well as, as rental, but starting with, with uh, I think the, more, the most impacted are people that are trying to rent. So keep in mind, as you're looking at these, the rental rates that different people at different incomes can afford, and then we'll compare that to what you have in the marketplace here. Um, because you, you know, the disconnect is that the housing stock, it's not that it's not getting built, it's just that it's getting built at, at rates that people at these income levels at your, at basically your workforce um, cannot afford. Um, the rent ranges that you show here this is what is represented specifically in Wheat Ridge, um, the percentages that are renting in each one of these, in the, at these levels. Um, so you can see, you know, the majority of them are 1000 to $2,000 a month for rent. Go back to the previous page, you know, someone that's making minimum wage can afford $641. So there, you know, if you have, and I'm not saying you can, that's why a minimum wage is probably not a livable wage to begin with, but that's a different conversation. But if you have, a lot of service workers here, you have a lot of retail in your community, which you do, um, that they can't afford to, to pay the rent that's here. Now let's look at the, um, and, the, and I, well, I'm leaving this for you so, so you can go through them. I'm not gonna repeat each one. Let's look at the home ownership um, situation. The average Wheat Ridge home price is $550,000, which for those of us that have been in, in the metro area for a long time, you know, the decades, decades, um, these numbers are just ridiculous, right? Except to a broker, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, but they're, you know, these are, Denver is not that much higher than this, um, but it's, they're, they're just ridiculous numbers um, for all of us that bought houses and started at $85,000 for a house and then up to 115 and, you know, and on and on. But, but for, for the average people to look at that amount, um, it's, it's pretty mind boggling. Um, and in order to, to afford that and have this monthly cost, you have to have an income of $90,000 and $90,300. Um, but the average income here is 57,000 and you can afford a $317,000 house. So where are people buying, where are people finding houses that they can afford then? Um, and, that's, and that is a couple hundred thousand dollar difference in, in price. Not all doom and gloom. I'll try to give us some hope here too. Um, but these are the concerns about home ownership. The home prices um, went up 13.4% um, in, in one year, um, and this is during you know this is during COVID, right? So, and I think this number here is pretty similar to what happened in the metro area, um, but it's it's a it's a b pretty big increase. And then incomes certainly never didn't go go up to it to um, meet that range, only went up 3%, 3.2%. Um, there have been some no growth ordinances, certainly what Lakewood did um, are, was, was not something that was helpful to the market by, by limiting the number of building permits that could be issued. So some of that was, that made it, that compounded it. But there are a lot of other things that, that compounded it, and certainly in the last year with, with COVID, and the supply chain issues and the, cons and, and the fact that there's not a workforce here um, to, build the, to build the houses even if we could keep up with it and, and come up with the supplies. So let's keep going on and looking at who needs it. Um, so to put a face on this, not a real face, but to give you just a reminder of who the people are, what are the, the positions people hold in the city that average earnings would fit into different area median income. And I'll, the, you know, the jargon of this is a little, can get a little bit um, annoying, so I appreciate that. I'll try not to do that. But the area median income is the, the way people, the way the federal government and, and CHAFA and local governments generally talk about the income levels that, that are eligible for, for publicly subsidized um, housing one way or another. So it's generally under 30% of the area median income is, is who Foothills Regional Housing Addresses 
and then they go up from there, and we'll talk about one project that we've been involved with um, where they had a higher range, but most traditional public housing um, authorities you, uh, address the 30% um, area median income and below. Um, so that captures, whether it's through the housing authority or someone else, that captures housing for the homeless and people that are, that are um, uh, at the poverty level. Um, then you get to the, 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 the positions I was talking about that are really paying somewhere around minimum wage, and this is what they can afford um, as, as you go up into to the um, dental assistance at 60%, 80% AMI, and then and, and you'll see school teachers are, are at the $58,000, um, 720 is the average average amount there in, in the 80% category, and it, ca it, it includes a couple of different examples of, of that. Again, the median income of Wheat Ridge fits into that at $52,747. Okay. So what, what happens then when, um, when people can't afford to live in housing, um, there are several different ways that government steps in. Um, local government, you know, your political will is is very important. You can't put a dollar value on that, but having a city council that's interested in addressing this issue is really important. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, funding, rental assistance, zoning, the how, how you how you treat entitlements, how you deal with density bonuses if you want to get in, involved with that discounted land, expedited permit, permit approvals. These are all things that you can control. The state has additional, and this is, I'm saying this kind of outside of the ARPA funds and the one-shot issues, uh, funding sources that you have access to now, which are wonderful because they're needed now more than ever. But in general, the state has funding that makes up some of the gap in these projects when, you need to, when they need to be built. Um, state tax credits, housing tax credits, um, um, step in as well. Federal level, um, there are programs that get funded that address special po uh, populations. There's a program for veterans that are homeless um, in particular, uh, and they're one population that's being, being uh, focused on in a, a project in Arvada that, um, that I can talk about for a minute. Home funds, you probably have access to those as well now, and vouchers, and, and the um, low-income housing tax credit program, which is administered through CHAFA, um, but it is federally authorized. It's probably the, mo the most important one that's available for rental assistance um, to make the economics of a project work because it brings in private capital as equity in a project. Uh, lots, of, lots of acronyms here of just who all the project partners are. We're involved in the development of, of uh, two affordable housing projects now, and um, and as I look at this list, um, every one of these every one of these groups is involved in different ways in each project, and it's the difficulty and the challenge is to how do you create that capital stack that fit that fills that gap because the gap keeps rising as construction costs go up, the gap get, keeps rising as land costs go up, and the income isn't rising. So you still have people that can only afford to the, a certain amount of their, their income, their gross income, to pay for rent, but the cost of these buildings continue to go up. So all of these partners are really critical ones, and they're, uh, and, you know, they're, they're there because they, this is their mission as much as, of, as anything else. Um, this is a development that I believe, Mayor, you were at the... Yes, mm -hmm. you were at the groundbreaking for this. Um, so we've been the development partner with the Foothills um, Regional Housing. Got to get their name right these days. But all this rebranding that goes on, um, and it's a great development that you you provided. You put your private activity bond mm -hmm. um, uh, commitment into, and um, I think we had. I've never been to a groundbreaking where there were so many mayors in my life. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really great because Jefferson County has a really wonderful working relationship among its elected officials. And this is an example of the kind of project that can happen with that. So this is just south of um, Old Town and 100 units. And there are uh, vouchers which will make, make pays the difference in the income that someone can afford when you put 30% of their income into housing and what it really costs uh, that are focused on veterans. So there'll be some amount of that 
It's also, it's also um, has special vouchers for kids that are aging out of foster care. Uh, and that makes it really unusual. So there are lots of populations that will be served. It's under construction now. Um, and it, and it's, it's a great, great project for the community. And it's, uh, it was just one of those great experiences for all of us involved with it that there was no opposition, which just never happens in Denver, I can tell you that. And in most other communities, it's not just Denver. So, um, so congratulations to you all for being part of that. Um, so one of the things that, um, that I was asked to talk about is the missing middle, because you have the subsidies that help, um, m maybe not enough on the homeless side because it's still a huge problem, but in terms of the housing authority programs that, that deal with a certain income level, and then you have market rate that people, um, most people in this room can, can afford to pay, and then you have this middle which is not fitting into it, make too much money for this program and not enough money for that to qualify for that. Um, so there are different kinds of home ownership models. It's harder on the, on the rental side for that, I think, um, because the priority is always gonna be on the populations that need, have the highest need, and that's gonna be the lowest income. And we deal with this constantly and have arguments about it in, in the city, city of Denver always, because there's so much focus on the homeless which we all care about deeply, but if we don't pay attention to the, needs, the continuum of needs, then when you solve someone's problem here, there's nowhere for them to go, and then they're back you know, where they were. So, we, and I think the same thing happens with home ownership. I think it's, it's, it's within my company, um, over the last 23 years, we've built more um, affordable for sale than we have rental, much more. Um, and, I, and I've done that because I really believe that it's important for people to have. Not everybody wants to be a homeowner, and especially this next generation apparently doesn't care about that any, as much as we did, but it's, it's still important to have that opportunity for people. Um, and the way you do it, it it's, all, it's as complicated, but with a different set of tools that are there. Um, and, and what has been done, and that we've been involved with the most, are deed-restricted units. Um, of a development that has, and I'll go through some of them that we've done, that you can see how, how different ones have been approached, but you have to deed restrict them. You have to put a, you have to be able to say, and to, up to the buyers of it, you're getting a home that is coming in that's much less expensive than the market, and we don't want you to just the next week or the next year, or even in five years, to go out, sell it at market, have that profit all be yours, and then we don't have that unit as an affordable unit anymore. So it's, you know, it can get controversial. The city of Denver is now going back to the inclusionary housing ordinance, which I don't believe you have one here. Um, it just requires that if you're building, and they've lowered it now to, I think, seven units or more, then 10% you know, of the units have to be affordable. So you know, if you think about it being, um, uh, it's, that's obviously just one unit. But you know, when you get up to the, the, side, the numbers of units that are being built in Denver, you know, a 300 unit, and this is apartments or condos, 300 units, then, you would, then you'd have 30 units that are affordable and they're deed restricted and they're making them forever. Um, so we have lots of, lots of my developer friends who are, who are freaking out about this and think everybody, that all these developments are gonna leave Denver and you know, that, 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 lots of stuff, which I don't believe. Um, but it's, it's, it's the only way that you, know, you can make them happen because the private sector is not gonna build affordable units that rent for X if they can rent them for X plus one. And so the, the, I, the issue here is that you can figure out the amount of affordability requirement that still allows a market level profit to be made. And you should be subsidizing it if you're requiring someone to build it where they're not getting a market rate. But you don't have to be, you know, you can, you can uh, you don't have to have a community that is guaranteeing a, a, pro a profit that is way out there for someone when, when you have a need for, for, for affordable housing. So that, again, is another thing you can have all kinds of philosophical uh, discussions about uh, because there are, right now in our country, um, I mean, there's no limit on profit. And so, um, and I, you know, I, I'm a private developer. I have partners. We, I have to look at the bottom line, I, you know, and we have, we have made we have made a profit on all the projects we've developed. Could we have made 5% more or 20% more? Pro probably, but we had a threshold and ours was a market threshold and we said it's our responsibility in a community to give back as well and to address some of the community needs. 
and that means that if it lowers what, what we could be getting, I'm okay with that. Now, you know, it's not 30% less. I mean, we're talking inc increments, you know, a couple, a couple percent or 5%. Um, but that is what inclusionary zoning does. It requires a certain percentage to be affordable. Um, increased density is important. Um, I have to say that when I sat until 9.30 on your last one, I did listen to, there was a, a long public hearing on a townhome project. Uh, and I thought, my God, if I come in here talking about 100 unit projects and giving them a density bonus of, of another 10%, you'll, you'll throw me out. So I don't know where the community is on density, but you have a great opportunity with Lutheran campus to really focus on, if you want to address affordability, and you want them to address affordability, then what does your zoning say about that? And if you want to give additional density to a developer that will put in some affordable units in it, that's a way that doesn't cost the city any money and the developer can make the economics work better because they get an extra 10 units. So it, it does work. It doesn't work in all, in all situations, but it can work in, in many. Um, Let's see, density, uh, and I, I don't know whether you have accessory dwelling units here yet. Um, you don't all know what they are, accessory dwelling? Yeah. Okay. Talk about that next. Are you? Okay, yeah. good. Well, they are, you know, the reason that they became um, as visible and as, as popular uh, and half of the city, I think, is by, at this point has been rezoned to allow them is that it's a way for homeowners to be able to afford to stay in their home and have an income from a, another unit behind them. Um, it's not made for VRBO. I mean, hopefully it doesn't end up being abused that way, that that's a rental, a, a, a rental that's a nightly rental. But it really was, it started in West Denver where you have a lot of homeowners that have been there for generations, but they can't afford to stay there because the taxes are going up, um, whatever. So they, they, were, they were allowed to build an accessory dwelling unit that gave them, and they got subsidized financing to do that that allowed them to stay there. And it really became a way to continue to, to stabilize those neighborhoods that are getting gentrified a lot. Um, land trust model, have you had any contact with the Elevation Community Land Trust? Do you know what they do? Okay. Love it. Yeah. So this is a, a group, I happen to sit on this board um, so I can talk about it more, um, but it's, it's a group that was started about three years ago, a uh, foundation funded with, I think started out with a couple million dollars from about five different foundations to go out and purchase land uh, in the same way that the Urban Land Conservancy does, but specifically for single family uh, affordable development. And so we've gone out and bought land. We've bought units when they came up in the market. Our first units were actually in, in Aurora. Um, done a lot of work in Denver. We're up in, in Fort Collins. Um, and then the land is owned by the Elevation Community Land Trust forever. So when you're looking at the cost of the house, you don't have any land costs in it. That person who buys the house uh, pays a, a nominal amount for lo the land lease, I mean, the, basically the ground lease. So they're paying elevation, whatever, $50, $100 a month for the ground, but they have a single family home, um, and some we've done some duplexes, but mostly single family, and they are, the prices are down at the, what people can afford it, at like the 70 to 80% of the area median income. So someone that is that's a teacher can afford it. Um, someone who is a, um, a firefighter. Uh, and it's a great model. It's it's been. Um, I mean, our goal is to have a thousand units within the community land trust um, by 2027. We just had our own board retreat last week. So uh, and and it's and it's getting a lot of interest from again from foundations. We have matching funds that have come from cities to do this. We have some land that's, you know, land that's being donated by cities, because it is perpetually affordable. If people want to move out, then there's a split in the profit. I mean, they get, the, they get some of the value because you don't want to put people in a position where they can never, they can never leave either. Um, very much the same as with Habitat. Um, Habitat um, is now, Habitat Metro Denver is now, has now merged with another land trust group, and they're doing, you, uh, I think the mayor mentioned you went out that the metro mayors went out, so it wasn't the city council, right. went out to the ARIA Denver development, um, and that is all in the land trust. So all 28 units there are part of Habitat's land trust. Um, so the cost of those units doesn't reflect the cost of the house, I mean of the land that's within it. 
co-housing model, I mean, is, is another one we can talk about if you have that kind of an interest. And it, um, but this is the, the, the home price of $317,000 is what at the average income someone that can earn, uh, can, can afford who lives in, in your community that is in that price range, which is what your median price range is. All right, what makes it hard? I mentioned this already that development costs, um, and even if you're not an evil developer, and, and you know, we're not all evil developers. Um, there's some, but we're not all. Um, you know, we, we have not been able to control the cost of lumber, of steel, of doorknobs, or anything, anything having to do with it. We can't, you know, no one can tell us when it's gonna be delivered. We have a project up on the ARIA campus that has been delayed for six months now. It's completely done, 24 condo units in a building if you first pulled in, because they can't get the cabinets. Um, and it's a local cabinet maker, but they can't get the wood. And it's just these, the stories, and it's, this is, you know, this has really been in the last year and a half. It's not, this is, hopefully this settles down a little bit, but it's still going on now. So the margins, the profit margins are much slimmer if you have all those uncertainties and the costs are, are higher. Um, um, so the gap financing, to make up that gap, it gets, it gets higher and higher, and, and the state happens to have funding now because of the ARPA funds, and they're increasing their funding for the gap, as well as um, uh, the city of Denver, at least in the, in the projects we're involved with. Um, the construction defect issues um, is another one, um, and it's, you know, it's, this is a, really applies to multifamily, more, more than single family units, even though what I'm hearing is it's beginning to move into the single family realm too, which is just mind boggling, but it's, it just, and it's not that we shouldn't protect people from having, from living, from buying a place if there's a bad builder. If, if not, it's not the bad builder, it's usually something happened during construction and it happens. I mean, and I had it happen on a project and I, I went to the insurance company and said, you know, this is, we gotta fix this. And we actually did a settlement where they paid without one lawyer involved. So that was like, that was a success. But it does happen. I mean, you know, we had a product that failed, uh, some siding. And, but in general, this is, it caught, the cost of this is adding 5% to a project, the cost of the insurance. And it's, you know, it sounds small, but they just keep adding up and then, and then it becomes impossible to make it, to make it work. Um, and the last one is, is that people will say, well, why bother, why do this if it's that much harder? Just build, build market rate housing. So i will just run through a couple, a couple of projects. So this is Monarch Mills, which is, uh, and these are um, not, not recent since by any means since, uh, in, impacted by COVID. Um, this is a deed restricted for 20 years, 56 of the 69 units. It's in the plat, it's in, the, in, in Central Platte Valley. It's right behind um, the Museum of Contemporary Art in, off of, Wewa, uh, off of um, Delgany and 15th. Um, um, I actually live there. I developed it, I live there. And it's a great place to live because we live in, a, in, in one of the unrestricted units, but the, it's just like normal people living there. You know, we have a firefighter, we have a librarian. It's like real people live there. It's not like so many of the high-end ones in Denver and downtown that are, that are investor units and people come down from Vail. And it's not, that's not the case in, in all of them, but it's in the case in a lot of them. Um, we were, in order to make the economics work here, um, Mark Falcone, who is the developer that um, did uh, Belmar and has done a lot of other developments, he, he has been very involved with the Museum of Contemporary Art, wanted to buy property and donate it to them. He wanted a place for that to be. Um, and so he bought, he was buying the whole block um, from East West Properties and East West um, smartly said, well, we have an affordable housing requirement, we'll sell it to you, but you have to take our requirement. Uh, and then he called me and said, so how do I do that? And by the end of the conversation, I said, I'll do it. So we, so he donated that land to us. He, we split the cost 50-50 on underground parking because that parking is very expensive, but we're right downtown and we, we needed it. Um, and, you know, and so we ended up with this really interesting little development with 13 uh, townhomes um, and he lives in one of them and we have the Museum of Contemporary Art there and then, and then 69 units behind it. Uh, and it's, it's complicated and it takes more time to do them, but it, um, you know, for some reason I, I like to do that. Fireclay lofts, um, 
is another one that's in, up in Rhino. Um, it's 166 units. We did 20% of them deed restricted. Uh, and this is one of the lessons learned on these kinds of things is the deed restrictions. All of a sudden, you sit back and you say, well, let's see, it's 20. This one was 15 years and they expired. And we thought, you know, it, when we first did it, we thought, is anybody going to live here? And we said, oh, I don't know. And, and then all of a sudden, the time goes by. And, and, and that's the case for all of Denver's is that they're all going to expire. And so we have, we're dealing with ways that we can, the city can buy back some of the, the units and, and we'll see. Uh, next is the one that your mayor was, um, was touring um, up in the right hand upper corner. It says Habitat, um, uh, whatever it says, I can't read it. Habitat, something or other. Oh, anyway, so it's a little neighborhood there, 28 units. Uh, and this is, this is a former convent. It was the uh, St. Fran Mary Chris convent, but St the Sisters of St. Fran Francis and I started working with them. This is the other part of the story is how long these things take, 16, 16 years ago. And it's, being, it's just about built out now. We have one more development here that has one more site. Um, and it will end up, and it was very consciously a mixed income community from the beginning. I mean, that's what we wanted to create. It's what the sisters wanted. You know, I had this great conversations with them because I didn't grow up Catholic. And I thought, you know, how am I ever gonna do this with these women, right? <laughs> so. And they said the same thing about me as a developer. They said, how are we ever going to deal with her? And we found out that our values were very similar. Um, we didn't want a gated community. You know, we wanted, we didn't want Walmart um, as much as, you know, that, that would be, or Costco, that would have been an option. Um, and we really wanted this to be a community that had people that, that were very different. And we also wanted to be focused on health. So we had a, um, a with, we're right across the street from Regis University, had a very close relationship with them along the way with their health sciences program. And we ended up um, going together to Colorado Health Foundation and got close to a million dollar grant from them to do all kinds of cool stuff that was health focused. So um, there's a one acre production farm here. We have a greenhouse. Um, there's a walk, a couple mile walk that's, you know, has all kinds of interesting things. It goes through, um, through the Regis campus. We have adult fitness equipment. And for the first four years, we had a, a um, healthy living coordinator that, that offered yoga classes in Spanish and English and all kinds of stuff to get people more activated and get, get the people to know each other. The red building is the co-housing community, which is a former convent. Um, and that is a condominium project, but it's with, with a, a very, very close relationship between the people. People that move into that want to know their neighbors' birthdays and their grandchildren's and, and they have dinner together every Sunday and it's a, it's a really interesting place for people to live if you want to be that close to each other. Um, everybody has their own units, they have their own kitchens and all that, but it's still a very, it's a really nice um, form of, of living for, for some folks. So the, co the, all the habitat units are at, at I think 70, 75%, 75, um, at, at the 75th percentile, AMI percentile. So, and three of them were closing in a couple of weeks and that's been a great, it's been a great experience and we thank your mayor for being a contractor again um, because we need people that know what they're doing there because I always th felt like when we went there with, with all my friends, everything had to get redone the next day. But I'm sure that they appreciated your, your work. Um, but that's, that's great. And then the building that says Warren Village First Step is a program that's starting, that's been around for a while, but it's for women coming right off the street that are homeless with their children. And it only, it only accommodates 21 people, but it's now starting in January, there's a really cool partnership with uh, Florence Crittenden, which is a program that DPS started many, many years ago for, for uh, girls that get pregnant in high school to help to make sure that they still get their education and get through. So we're gonna have moms, young moms and babies living here. Um, which is great for me because I love babies, so I like to go over, all the way over there, holding their babies. Um, and and then we have a lot of market rate units here. The units on the right hand side, the Mark Mary Crest apartments and the RE apartments are low income housing tax credit projects, so they are at the 30 to 60 percent area median income. So there are 130 of them. Some of the people that that live there are employees at Regis. Um, so when you talk about who all these people are, they're, they're, they're us, you know, they're us. So it's a really interesting mix here. And, um, and our, 
I think at the end of the day, I mean, when the last phase is the last building is built, we'll have over 500 units here, and we will have, I should have this number in my head, but about 40% of them will have been, will be um, affordable. So that's that, and you can see the, the, um, the farm, you can actually see our mayor leaning over, and, and, and it, the uh, father Fitzgibbons is there as well. So just a, a sample of some of the development that's there, that's the, uh, there. So what can we do now? So this is probably the most important part of the conversation. Um, and I understand that you got a grant from the state, so the number, for, the number one, you're on your way, developing a strategic plan, and that's great. Um, and you know that will define how you want to deal with, with these issues. Um, preserving affordable, existing affordability, using a, the land trust model. If the city has any extra land, any excess land, or if CDOT has any land that's in your city, you know, knock on their door. The land trust, ha I mean, the, the state land board has it. They, they have been involved with two affordable housing developments. Um, I don't know where they're, whether if they have any land holdings here, but they, um, they're interested in this. I mean, the governor has been very clear with state agencies that um, he doesn't want land just sitting around anymore. Or, or RTD, they're a little harder to, <laughs> to deal with right now, but, but they have plenty of land. Um, and, I, and, and, and trying to get it into some kind of a setting that is perpetual, I mean, that it will stay affordable for a long time. Um, partnerships, you're doing that now with the hospital. Um, you know, we've had conversations with, with Denver Health about a building that they are moving out of into a new building and said, don't tear that building down, use it for employee housing. Um, and that, those, are, those will be conversations that I, I have no idea. Both of my grandchildren, two of my, my the two little girls were born at Lutheran. Um, so I remember the campus, but I don't know what the condition of any of the buildings and whether they're gonna clear them all or, or if, you know, if maybe they don't need to do that. Um, it's a lot more expensive to build a new unit than to take an existing building and make it work. But not all the time can you, can you get the density you need. Um, so all of these other things, the, ex the incentives, expedited city approvals, I'm sure that you don't have anybody that ever complains about how long it takes to get through the city, right, community development director? Um, but you know, our, we, in Denver, it's, it's pretty intense right now. And developments, I mean, you have a lot coming into you, into the city, and we, we, we all are sensitive about that, but we all think our project's the most important, and we don't understand why that one's not getting addressed. So. Um, fee waivers, all those things, and again, I said political support, which is really important. Um, and funding to help fill the gap. Um, you know, the city, I think, puts in, um, the state puts in, they're going up to $35,000 a unit for each affordable unit that comes through. This, these are apartments that are going in for tax credits. They get vouchers. The, city's, the city of Denver is now creating a voucher program of its own. Um, you know, you can be really creative with, with funds you have in the city if, you know, if this is your, one of your highest priorities. Um, ADU development is your next topic. Um, and, and oppose no growth ordinances, which I know if you have this kind of interest here today, you're not, that's probably not on your list. Um, so that would, that's, those are the things that come to mind and maybe some of those will fit into your strategic plan and hopefully you'll be one of those outstanding um, communities that says, this is how you do it, because we need you. So, questions? Thank you very much, Susan. Very, uh, yeah. very interesting uh, presentation. And um, we'll let you sit down, and we'll maybe some uh, questions from council. And uh, Ms. Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Susan, thank you so much for your for your presentation and also for being patient enough to come back to us. I know that was a long night to sit through to be said, to be asked if you could come back at different times. So thank you for that. Um, I, one of the things I wanted to ask you that you had mentioned is the, the construction defect law. Now, I felt like that had some changes to it a couple of years ago that maybe were going to encourage some developers to start building condos again. Yeah. You, can you discuss that just real quick? So what has never been addressed, which is the, what is, makes it the most difficult, is that 
in the state of Colorado, you don't have the right to repair. And without the right to repair, you don't, and, and for whatever reason, the legislature doesn't, well, it's not the legislature, it's the pressure that's put onto them from att the attorneys that are, that are ramping up business to, to do this. But, you know, if you don't have the right to repair, then you are, I guess it is, um, then you're always going to have that risk that you're going to have a lawsuit. There were some changes that were made, and there were, and there's a group um, of people that are that are having conversations now about what can happen beyond that now. Um, that you know whether this legislative session people would be interested. But you know the first conversation I had with um, with a member of the legislature was, don't bring back anything on this this year. It's not gonna, nothing's going to get through. And I I just you know I don't know what to say. So we're trying to think about what could the state do, what could, um, you know, the, the, the governor did the, um, what was it called, the, for the rural health, rural neighborhood areas that couldn't get health insurance coverage, or the co-insurance program. So we thought, well, maybe, is there a way to do it, that this, there's a state fund that takes some of the risk, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a first, first risk pool um, that might lower the rates. Um, but part of the issue also is that there are less and less insurance brokers, less and less insurance companies that are providing the insurance. Um, so even though the claims, I mean, I haven't heard of a claim in a long, long time, um, but they, they just, they're, they're not, they don't want to be in the business. Um, so it's, it's still a problem. So the only way is to subsidize the rate, which doesn't mean, which annoys me a little bit because the insurance companies then are continuing to, to have, to get the full full value there, but full cost. Um, but we haven't really figured out another way of doing it. But one thing is, is that if you're building affordable condos, you're less likely to have claims because they're not million dollar condos that Anschutz built. You know, so it's not like a nonprofit built developer um, who's building them or, or a for-profit that's building $200,000 condos has the deep pockets of someone else. So um, there's a, like a 92 unit of 100% affordable development that just opened up in, um, in the, not Baker, but it's off of the Santa Fe Arts District area. Um, Elevation Land, Land Trust owns the land under it. Um, and yeah, they bought insurance and they paid, it, it contributed to, to the cost of the overall project, but I think that's a less likely candidate for a lawsuit, and I, I'm saying this on TV, right? This is ridiculous, <laughs> but it's. Um, but I think it's just that's not where trial lawyers want to spend their time. They're looking for the more expensive ones. Thank you very much. Additional questions, Ms. Dozman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Susan, for coming and presenting to us. Um, could you explain a little bit more about how, like, the land trust works, and um, maybe give like a concrete example of, of like what partners came together, um, how the money was kind of brought in the pot, and how, like, yep, okay. sure. Um, and this is the Elevation Community Land Trust. Right? So it was about four years ago, and it is a combination of Colorado Health Foundation, the Denver Foundation, Gates Family Foundation, Pat Strikers in, what's the Bohemian Foundation out of Fort Collins. And it was presented at, to them. Uh, the pitch was made really by the Gary Williams, um, the, the Piton Foundation, by Sam Gary, that if we can't control, if, if we can't get a, a affordable housing in our communities, then we're losing our workforce. And I mean, I've, everybody knew that this was, this was a problem. And, and they came in, and, and these are PRI investments on their part. Um, they are, if ever, long term. I mean, they expect them to be, since the land is there forever, their money is in the land. So it's not as if they don't have some collateral, but it really is an investment that will stay stay there forever. And they were really interested in it, and they continue to be. I mean, because this is, as this grows, we think we need a 1,000 units to be self-sufficient. We need to build that up because then we can, then every penny that comes in, none of it goes for overhead. Um, and we can then create even more housing. Um, but it was, it was a, it, it's a model that is a national model. It's not so much a national model being used in housing the way this one is. Most of the land trust models are like the Urban Land Conservancy, where there are 
um, large portion, large parcels of property that are purchased for some public purpose. Um, and the idea there is is that if the, if you don't have a somebody that has community interest and you let it be purchased by um, the private sector, it will never have that community interest. And um, so the Urban Land Conservancy was formed maybe 15, 20 years ago, probably probably 20 now, uh, and was the first the first version of that in Colorado, in Denver. And there are a number of buildings that are kind of nonprofit centers that ULC owns. They also bought a lot of, they bought land that was then, um, they were repaid by a developer that was building affordable units. Um, this, this one goes into it and there continues to also be um, a, a, a lot of touch with the residents. I mean, you want them to be successful, you want them to be able to, to manage their money and, and to stay in that home. Um, so it is a, a little bit more hands-on than just building a unit and saying, here, have a nice life, because people are at the, you know, they're, they're buying it at, a, uh, at an income level that, you know, something happens in their job and they could miss mortgages and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, um, training and, you know, on management of the financing. But the, it all was finance, it was all set up, and then the city of Denver put in a chunk of money, um, and the city of Aurora matched for each unit. They came in with, I think, twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars a unit as well. So it's just kind of taking off in different places with different different ways. So every every community that has a conversation with Elevation ends up having a different kind of structure that works for that community. Yeah, because I, I mean, I guess m the direction my thought was going in is, you know, this was kind of local works when they were we were 2020. This was their initial goal was to um, buy houses and put them and, and have them be affordable for homeowners in our community. Um, and as we know, local works is sitting on a reserve at this point in time, and we'll probably have a broader conversation about local works at, at some point or another. But it, it seems as if like we have we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we don't tap into local works and maybe our Wheatridge Housing Authority to reactivate them and, and see what we can do in our community um, aside of just policy making and, and legislating mm -hmm. and doing deed restrictions, but also investing that money that um, local works has in their coffers back into the community. And you and can so do this with existing- wondering, like, Would it be something where the city has land, local works has money, Right, and we can make it to do that. Like that yeah. work. and it also is. Um, it's being you. It can be used. And the first ones that we did were all existing homes, and went in, in Aurora. The prices were better than they were in Denver. And I mean, now now everything's pretty unaffordable. But I mean, went in and bought um, six units in one neighborhood or, or on two different blocks, and um, no and no one they were vacant anyway. Um, and we renovated them, and then we sold them, and they stayed in the land trust model. Um, and that's and that or you can go in with a homeowner who is eligible and do some renovation and and if they agree to put it into the land trust then then you can actually pay for their their renovation because they we're paying for the land separately so it is i mean it really is really depends on the housing stock you have and, and what other resources you have but it's it's a uh, it you know it doesn't solve the whole problem but it's a piece of it additional questions uh, Mr. Ohm. Yeah, I want to go back to the um, the litigation condos. So, has there ever ever been a discussion about the uh, owners of the condos uh, forfeiting their individual rights to sue and delegating a single entity um, akin to you have apartments? There's typically one owner. Um, well, that's what. It's one of the things that the legislature took away in the last session. They took away the rights of local, I mean, you can't go and ask a, um, you can't require someone who buys a unit to waive their rights. Um, you can ask, but you can't require. So it was for many years, you know, you go in there and as part of the condominium declarations, you'd say yes and I, yes, and I do this and I do this and I waive my rights to this. And they felt that that was, um, that was taking away without people really understanding what the implications were that it was taking away their rights. Um, so I don't, I don't know, but it's, it's an interesting question about whether it could be 
delegated. I think what it is now is that you have to have more than 75% before you can file a suit. You have to have a, a, a more than a majority of the owners agreeing. And that's better than, than having, you know, be one at one at a time. Um, but it's still, it's still uh, apparently in the, in, in the insurance industry view, it's still too risky for them. And I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure why, but it is. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I've got uh, Ms. Hultine and then Ms. Nossler back online. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Susan, for your presentation. Although your name tag says you're Valerie Nossler back, oh, so <laughs> good. Um, welcome to council. Thank you. Um, I am just curious if you could talk a little bit about the deed restriction in terms of how that program actually allows the owners to build some equity without actually capitalizing on the full market gain. Yep. Um, it's, it's a good question because it is, the, philosophically, it's the one that people are, are um, the most concerned about. But um, it depends on the program, of course. But in the Monarch Mills building, um, people could have 3% a year increase in value. And over the course of, and you would know this, over the course of a 10-year period, that's, that's market. You know, I mean, if you're, if you're lucky. I mean, during some of our 10-year periods here, nobody, no one got 3% a year. Um, in others, it's in, in habitat or in others that are deed restricted, it's, it's a, you take the, you know, you get a market, you get an appraisal and then you get 25% of the increase and, um, some, and, and, that's, and that's all you can get. So it really, it varies and again, it, um, it is one of the things that people um, argue against the most, which is, you know, so they've been in, why don't they deserve that? Well, and it's, and it's you know, it's, it, in two, two years from then, um, if you paid three hundred thousand dollars for it, and it's and it really goes up to six hundred thousand because that was a market, then should you get three hundred thousand dollars of of equity there? So um, it just has to, it'll it just depends on the community and how you do it. So it's I mean it it's enticing to me because it does allow people to build some equity. I mean yeah. we're we're dealing with different gradients here of just getting people into housing, getting them into stable housing, but you know, ultimately the more people we can help build equity, yep. it's, it's using those dollars to their benefit. Um, I'd be kind of curious also, you know, we're, we are a small but mighty city here in Wheat Ridge. <laughs> and you know, one of the things we really grapple with is using our dollars locally versus like, how do we best, you know, contribute to the regional and county level. Mm -hmm. And if you could, maybe speak a little bit to effective strategies for, for a smaller city like us um, that may not have a lot of, um, of our own capital. I know you've identified other strategies that can be used around different assets and different policies, but speaking a little bit to local versus regional and maybe speaking to in lieu of programs um, that can be better leveraged locally versus regionally. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, the... the um uh, I still call them the Jefferson County Housing Authority. Um, Foothills, um, Foothills does a great job of of representing the, the county. And I don't know whether when you were making your comment, you're talking about Wheat Ridge having its own housing authority, if that was what you were saying. Um, but Jefferson, I mean, they Foothills does a great job, and I don't know how active they have actually been within Wheat Ridge, or if you. And I don't know. Did, are there? Do they have units here? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, and, and to the extent that you're able to work with them and find land and support rezonings or whatever it is for them to be to be more visible here, um, I mean that's probably the best thing you can do because they, I mean they have they have the expertise they have the they have access to resources that um, when smaller communities are all competing with with each other it it doesn't end up well for anybody um, so it seems like that regional there the fact that they're a regional. Housing Authority makes some sense. Um, you know, I would, I, I do think that Elevation or the Urban Land Conservancy, who bring money with them, um, they don't necessarily ask you. I mean, they, they may ask you to match, but I think that they look at each municipality's ability in a different way. Um, and, but I think the, the developing some of those relationships where, where these groups have, have access to other capital is is probably the best thing to do um, and and if you you know you, you do have you know you do have things going on here I mean I 
it won't go, I don't know, I know you just approved the master plan for it, but that's a big campus. Um, and I don't know whether that whether that's ever gonna come back to council again. Well, I assume they have to come back for rezoning or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, that's your leverage. I mean, it's not, and it, and most, there are lot, not a lot of communities that have campuses that large that are gonna become something else. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's and, and you can either end up with that being a very cool high-end development that is, it's great, and that would be wonderful if that happened too, but that may not be the only thing you need in your community. So take advantage of that and, um, and, and try and get that balance in that may not, they may not say that that will be, that they will, that will bring the highest price to them when they're dealing with a developer, but um, they're a nonprofit too. Let's not forget that they are, the SCL is a nonprofit. So they, they have, you know, they have some other, other pressures on them. I'll tell you, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, you've been dealing with it for a long time. All I did was go there for births. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, it's always that, that rub with, with large institutions that are, that, that are their nonprofits in their community. The other, the other group is, um, I mean, you're, you're very fortunate to have um, the first, first foundation. Uh, um, Colorado uh, First. Colorado First. Yeah. first um, Kelly, Kelly Duncan. Kelly Duncan. Um, and uh, she's really interested in affordable housing. I mean, she actually reached out to me before, before this, and maybe this was just a coincidence. We were having lunch or something, because I knew her in her past life with the Colorado Health Foundation, but we had a long conversation about what can happen actually on that campus, or in general, what role can they play to help? So, you know, um, find a role for them. I mean, if they want to be an active partner here, um, they can they can dedicate funds and and if you have some land I mean it's it's not as easy as and you know this is what you do for a living but it's it's not as easy as just saying okay here's some land and and here's twenty five thousand dollars but it takes it takes a lot a lot of energy from people who are who have common vision um, and and stuff gets done and it doesn't have to take nineteen years so mm -hmm. great thank you we Susan hope. yeah thank you. Um, I have uh, Councillor Nossler back online and had a question for us. Uh, Ms. Nossler Beck. Thanks, Mayor, and thanks, everybody. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful that I get to join from remote. I'm just kind of across the street, but um, thank you for that. Um, I, I wanted to first just uh, recognize, um, I thought that the presentation was so helpful. Um, one of the questions that had come up um, earlier. Oh, I'm going to change my view. This is really weird. I can see myself on like three screens. Ugh. I'm sorry. Four of you. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Um, one of the um, conver conversations that came up during one of um, our uh, city council meetings was really being able to define what affordable housing is. And I thought that your presentation did a really incredible job of um, you know, putting um, faces and jobs and um, families to what these numbers mean and what's affordable. Um, and the gap that you brought up um, or the disconnect that happens between both the need for homeless um, housing and people who are um, in that situation versus um, the workforce housing component um, is a challenge that I think is going to be one of our hurdles to cross um, when we start talking about trying to implement or make any changes, whether that's to zoning or, um, you know, trying to figure out how to work with developers on this. Um, do you have any good examples of um, communities that have maybe messaged um, messaged those those two types of issues you know areas of concern differently um, both the workforce training and the and the homeless um, situation do you have any good examples because they do just get bucketed together yeah, they do. Um, and this isn't exactly on point for your with your question but my favorite marketing program um, for that missing middle piece uh, was, was years ago, San Rafael County, which is across the bridge from 
San Francisco, um, their Chamber of Commerce wasn't even the city. The Chamber of Commerce ran, um, bought all of the, the advertising on the sides of all the buses there and had pictures of firefighters and teachers. And, and, the, and it, the line was, we're, he, we're, we're happy to, to um, teach your children or to provide fire services. It's too bad we can't live here. And they, and they did it over and over and over again. And it was very effective. And they, every time they went in for a bond issue, it passed. And they, and they kind of got ahead of it. Not that anybody gets ahead of it in, in, in that county. But um, I thought that was, I mean, really trying to put a face on who we're talking about here. Um, and of course, back then, the homeless issues weren't what they are today. So let me think about that, about, um, you know, I, you know, the, ish, the homeless issue is so, uh, is, is so out of control right now. And, and I don't know what your, where yeah, you know, things and are Susan, and, in your community. And so it's, on that, you know, we, we are doing a lot to try and address that issue as well. Um, and so, you know, um, this is kind of walk and chew gut. Uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm just asking if you have any good examples of communities that have been able to walk and chew gum at the same time on this on these two buckets um, in the affordable I, housing. I, I'm not sure that there are any examples around the country right now that are doing yeah. that. I mean, I okay, so then are, Wheat Ridge yeah, is gonna not, be first. Yeah, that's, why, that's right, you need to be first. Um, I had one other quick question. Um, with, with the AMI um, and uh, the you know cost of a of a home um, I think you, you know you're showing those those various numbers um, is that like is that would that be for a, a teacher let's just or I, I would like to use the home health care worker example because that is confounding how low that um, income is um, but if a home health care worker is bringing home twenty nine thousand um, dollars a year, is that for that home health care worker's entire family? So is that housing for a family or is that housing for just one person? It, 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 that, that particular number is a single person's income. So if you have two people, obviously, if you have two wage earners there, then I mean, I, and I have a chart that I, that I have to pull out myself, but because this is Jefferson County numbers of what the income levels are and what the rent levels are uh, for for different different size families for you know two person families and, and up and um, and what the size the number of bedrooms in it so it, it does vary but okay. if somebody has an income of twenty seven thousand dollars a year they're not going to be a homeowner I mean yeah. and, and even at fifty four thousand dollars a year that is tough I mean I think that there was the one example of that but you know the even though it's I mean I'm very active with elevation, and I hear what our prices are or Habitat's prices are compared to what they used to be, you know, and it's affordable unit. We I mean, hell, we're doing units at $300,000. And we think that's, that's, you know, we're proud of ourselves, but it's still, sure. it's just too much. But it costs that to build, I mean, to build them um, without any property in them. So it's, um, it is, it's a dilemma, but you gotta have to just take a piece of it and try and deal with with if that you know figure out what the most the highest priority income group is or work you know whatever whatever group you think is um, you have the biggest issue with and see if you can figure out how to address that with the production of housing uh, and that's 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 the only thing you can do because right? you can't solve I mean there's no city that's solving all the problems um, and it and it, and and the fact that you're talking about addressing homelessness at the same time you're looking at the workforce is, is really healthy because it's, you can't, you know, you can't just pick one, but you know, it's, it's really hard to even figure out to do one. Mm. Um, but, but you need to look at that at, at both of them. So I applaud you for that. I'll come back in a year and see how it goes. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Susan, can you speak a little bit about density um, bonus? So, <clears throat> I, I know that at a certain point, bonus density doesn't it doesn't pencil out anymore, right? right? So if it's if you're going from, you know, three stories to four stories, if you have to go from stick frame to steel, if you right. you know, so um, can you just talk about like some ways that you feel like bonus density are successful? 
Yeah, and it's, um, it, is, it is important to, to differentiate those because three to five, five to eight, eight stories and above, um, you can really make the efficiencies work when you get, I mean, you get above eight stories, you're getting into high rise building and, and building another couple floors onto that, um, you don't, you're not changing major codes on it. Um, and that's where it's worked the best. Uh, it, it, you're right, it, unless, unless the number of units is that dramatic and you have a kind of building that is, that is the, you can get a lot of units on it to take on the extra cost of going from, from a, a wood frame building to a steel, um, it doesn't matter. Even though in this market, um, it might not be that big of an issue. I mean, it really, the, the costs of, of lumber and with the cost of lumber is coming back down, the cost of steel is going back up. But it's not just those building materials, it's a lot of the other fire um, requirements. So it, I think it's mostly effective is when you're already up at that height and you go higher. Gotcha, and do you think, um, let's see if there, we, I mean, we do have an, an amazing opportunity with Lutheran and um, but we do have some other smaller um, infill developments mm -hmm. that happen in our community where it's, just, you know, it's, it's uh, an acre lot and you know they're putting 22 units on it mm -hmm. um, do you do you think that uh, a successful strategy with with bonus considering bonus density in that kind of situation would be um, you know like you will we'll give you 22 but we'll give you 24 if you if you make two of those you know mm -hmm. a deed restricted affordable mm -hmm. Do you think that that that, that is enough is enough um, uh, of a of a bonus density of a of a bonus there for it to be to be something they would bite on, or do you think there'd have to be like an additional, and plus we'll give you this money right. to kind of fill it, that? Gap? I mean, it depends on whether again you're changing building types. I mean, are you? Can Sorry, I'm thinking like townhouse. I guess I'm, I'm thinking for, like for townhouses. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, it's. It's pretty expensive to build townhomes as affordable. I mean, unless you can, you know, get some subsidy in them, but they, the construction costs for just to build one are pretty, are pretty high. So they're, but they could be less expensive than, than what, what, what the other ones are. Um, I think if you're talking about a townhome development and you can give, and you give ex excess, I mean, it, if, but most, most builders are gonna maximize what they're building on that site to begin with. So I'm not sure why they wouldn't be building that extra two. So I don't, and I, I don't I know what I the circumstances like if, if are. If planning said, you know, you can only have 22 on this lot, but right, right. then if we had some something that right. said, if somebody's building affordable, then, then we they can, can give them can, the extra. Right. Yeah, so right. they can have a, you know, maybe one of their buildings go from four to five, right. and then one of them goes from three to four or something, right. depending it on the could, configuration. It, I mean, it could make a difference there. I mean, I, I, it, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those that depends, but mm -hmm. the, if, if you're talking about the same kind of building site and, and, and you're not, you know, you, you know, you're, <laughs> this guy's giving me, is looking at me over there in terms of, what, <laughs> um, you know, you still have setbacks, you still have things you have to, you have to live with, but maybe your open space requirement can be a little bit less and maybe there are ways you can densify it. The, the one thing you have to be careful about, and it's not so much with townhomes, but when people densify, they start making the units smaller. And, and that's part of the problem we have in Denver, which is that we have thousands of one-bedroom units. And, um, and that's not family-oriented. I mean, if, you're, if your priority here is for families that, that, you know, that what you want them to stay in Denver, I mean, in, in Wheat Ridge, and you want them coming to Wheat Ridge, then you, you need to build two- and three-bedroom units um, and, and not let them say, I, oh, you give you a bonus and you build a one-bedroom unit, because that's, that's really not what you need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions before we, you've, you've done a lot of talking tonight, so thank you very much. Sure. I really, thank uh, you. really appreciate it, Mr. Here. States. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, <clears throat> one quick question. We have a lot of older apartments and, and townhomes and things like that uh, with like older landlords in the city. Is there, are there programs that go in and help some of those established landlords that maybe have apartment complexes, and things like that, um, turn some of their units into affordable housing? Um, you know, there's something called naturally occurring affordable housing, which which is probably what those older ones are. So they're you know they're they're there. Um, um, they're NOAA, whatever that stands for, um, and 
they you're saying that they just need to modernize them and not and not raise the rents. That would be the hope. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, there I, I can't think of other than you using you have community development block grant funds. You, you you make choices on how you spend that. City of Denver takes a block of that and and they use that for single family rehab for people that are senior that want to stay in their home. Uh, you could probably create a program like that for for people that are there. I mean, the other thing you could do is you could go to um, the Elevation Community Land Trust on that one, not Elevation, uh, the Urban Land Conservancy, who has bought up a bunch of apartments, not a bunch, but some, in two that I know of in Lakewood and, and others in Denver, and they have found you know, someone who wanted to retire and paid them market value for it, and then they renovated it and they kept it as affordable. Um, so they, I mean, though, if you have them, I mean, this is, the housing stock you have here could be a benefit. I mean, that could be, that, that could be something that's, a, that's a, an asset for you, not a liability. Okay. Well, thank you very, oh, Ms. Hutchinson. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just thinking about something which, I don't know, might not have a whole lot to do it should. Um, our interest rates right now are low, okay? The price of property is high. So is there any thought about when the interest rates go high, then the value goes down in the houses? Yeah, except in this market, it's not happening that way. I mean, it, ha it didn't happen that way, you know, the, in the last cycle. I mean, there's just so much of a demand in, you know, in the metro area is still growing so much, or the state's growing so much, that people are still coming in here paying above market prices, which just inflates the value even more. Um, and, and, it, and it seemed to be independent of what the interest rates were, um, because people that, are, people that are buying a lot of these units are paying cash for them. That's, you know, that's, it's, and it's, it's great, but it's not helping the overall economics of what's going on. Well, I just don't believe the interest rates are going to be staying no, I don't, this I agree. low. <laughs> okay. No, I agree. Because I know you spoke of the 80s or whatever like that. In 1981, interest mortgage rates were 18%. Right. Okay. Right. So yeah. and that, if and it goes up high, like that, there's right. no way right. that people are going to be able to afford mm. not to be millionaires. So. Well, you know, the, the wonderful thing about Habitat as an organization is that they, they are their own lender. And they don't char they charge 2% or 1%. I mean, forever they never charged any interest on it. And you can only do that when you're a nonprofit. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's the thing the private marketplace thing. And hopefully we'll never get to that point again. But you're right. I mean, they are, they're creeping up as we speak mm -hmm. right now. So it's, it's hard to control that. And that's, that's not where we want to be. So when it's affordable housing, then that's a fixed rate for it's ever. A, it depends on people's mortgages. If they're mm. if they're buying, if they buy an FHA, if they have an FHA mortgage, then it's fixed. Mm -hmm. And and if they buy, I mean, it depend. It really depends on lenders and how much they're get, how how long of a fixed rate people can buy. They can they can work with the market themselves and make assumptions about it going down and and get a variable rate interest a mortgage. But uh, I wouldn't do that in this market. So, but, yeah. they, but there are plenty of fixed rate mortgages. They're just the rates are going up now. Uh huh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ohm, and then Ms. Uh, Fultine. I have I have one last question. Okay. Um, do, do you ever see any live work affordable units? <laughs> you know, um, we developed them at Fireclay, and I don't know that what, what the picture was, but we along this is along Blake Street, and we had all of the first floor units had. Um, had workspace on it, and then upstairs was the kitchen and bedroom and that kind of thing. And the only ones that we actually sold for that were to a couple of artists whose parents paid for them. <laughs> um, so we kept scratching our heads saying, why isn't this working? And it was just that at that time, there people weren't working, working at home as much as they are now. So it, it may be that that's a, a very viable model now, um, but, but it, it wasn't in the past for us. Um, but, you know, it, it could very well come back that way. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Holtine? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my question is for Patrick. Um, it was referenced earlier, so uh, the city was awarded the DOLA grant. Can you just refresh our memory really quickly what that grant is and what the timeline is for that? Yeah, thank you. I was going to mention that at the end, but <laughs> good segue. Well, this is the end. Um, so that is the end. Then. Um, yeah, the city uh, was, was fortunate enough to receive um, its um, 112000 um, and it's from the uh, DOLA, um, Colorado Department of Local Affairs. And it's for an affordable housing strategy planning grant. And um, it's essentially going to create a strategic plan for the city um, and, an action, and an action plan on affordability, affordable housing in Whitney Ridge. So um, we're really excited about it. We're staff's working on a timeline right now. We're working with purchasing on de developing the scope for the, for the, for the RFP to um, hire a consultant to help us with that process. So um, we're hoping, I don't know when we'll get it out, out to bid, but soon. I'm just I'm curious, uh, Council Member Stites brought up a couple of weeks ago um, what it would take to reinvigorate our, uh, our own housing authority, understanding that we don't currently have any funding mechanism for them to be talking about how to be using the funding. But it seems to me if we are undergoing that strategy, it would be prudent for us to reactivate them, to have them as partners uh, discussing that. So in order to get that moving again, what is an action that Council needs to take? Um, nothing really. I mean, I think we're developing a list of stakeholders who's mm -hmm. going to be involved in the process, and I think they'd make sense that they'd be part of, they'd be a stakeholder in that process. Okay. Yeah. All right. So if we wanted them to actually start meeting again, our housing authority is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they meet when needed. Um, I think they have to meet kind of once right now because mm -hmm. um, they don't have any money or any projects, but if, if we do um, um, roll them in as a stakeholder, um, yeah, we'll just, I mean, Ken and Lauren, um, manage that, that authority so they can schedule a meeting with them uh, okay. to get them involved. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Susan, thank you very much. Thank very uh, interesting thank presentation. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of good uh, work that you're doing and a lot of good ideas for us to pursue. Great. So thank you. We thank you. We thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes. We can certainly do um, do five minutes. Why don't we uh, come back at about uh, five or so after? Mm -hmm.
right, we will uh, see resolve. Well, he'll, he'll do it. Okay. So we will reconvene our meeting, and uh, we will go to agenda item number two. Um, this is accessory dwelling units, also known as ADUs, update. And uh, Mr. Goff, we probably have a presentation on this. I think. We do. Okay. Um, very much anticipated topic. Um, and uh, tonight we have uh, Ken Johnstone, Community Development Director, of course, and Scott Cutler, who did um, a good portion of the work on this. But um, we'll turn it over to Ken, maybe, to introduce it. Yeah. Yeah, Scott's definitely uh, been our point person on this topic for a while now. So he's done a lot of great research and work on this topic, along with kind of a little bit of a parallel topic, which was the, the short-term rental ordinance from a year or so ago. So I'm going to turn it over to him. But uh, our approach tonight is just to kind of see where Council is at on this topic, really. I mean, we gave you a lot of information in your packet. It was a lengthy memo, but I think hopefully a, a thorough one. Mm -hmm. um, and rather than regurgitate that in a, what would be a very long PowerPoint, um, we operate on the presumption that you read it, and uh, mm -hmm. we're going to hit some highlights and then just uh, give you some opportunity to give us feedback and um, see where you stand on this topic. Great. And of course, just a reminder, this was um, one of your strategic plan priorities. Okay, Mr. Cutler. Thanks. Um, I'm going to do this for a second. Um, yeah, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, I don't want to rehash the full 10-page memo, uh, but I did want to go over some of the, I guess, main talking points, um, and then at the end, potentially make a recommendation to you all. Um, first and foremost, um, like has been mentioned already, um, ADUs, specifically non-conforming ADUs, were identified as a strategic um, plan uh, for city council in their retreat, uh, I guess about 10 months ago now. Um, and so we're back to talk about this finally. Um, so before I jump into anything, I just wanted to define what an ADU is um, to put that out there. Um, and, and there's various definitions. Each city kind of defines it slightly differently, but the American Planning Association, the APA, defines uh, accessory dwelling units as a small independent residential dwelling unit, which is located on the same lot as a standalone home. Um, and ADUs can take a number of shapes or forms. Um, notably, they can be either attached to the house um, or a detached structure altogether. Um, and, and the graphic in the staff report really shows kind of the three main types of ADUs, whether there be an attached internally in the basement or attic or an addition and then a detached structure. Um, ADUs have been uh, in pub the public process in Wee Ridge for quite some time, uh, back in 2015 and 2016. Um, we we're in a pretty similar position, uh, although uh, public sentiment may have been slightly different. Um, and at that time in 2016, city council um, decided to table the ordinance um, due to the need for some more discussion. So since then, there's been a lot of public efforts around ADUs, not necessarily ADUs specifically, but um, ADUs have been kind of included in most of the city's um, public engagement processes since then, including the neighborhood revitalization strategy, citizen surveys, and most recently, the Let's Talk program, uh, which is being run through the community development department as well. And, and overwhelmingly, there's been um, really strong support for ADUs within the city. Um, the most recent resident survey showed about two-thirds of residents supporting or strongly supporting ADUs, um, similar or even higher numbers in some of the Let's Talk programs. Um, and so just kind of anecdotally, staff gets a lot of inquiries about from property owners about whether they can build a new ADU on their property or whether an existing structure is an ADU, and, and the answer right now is no, we don't allow ADUs. Um, so there's not really much we can tell them other than to stay engaged. Um, but as the data shows, I mean, there's been multiple, multiple public engagement opportunities since that original city council study session in 2016 all the way through today. Um, so I wanted to get into some of the details now. We, we don't define accessory dwelling unit in our code. We do define dwelling unit, which is a building designed for occupancy as complete independent living quarters for one or more people um, with independent sleeping and kitchen facilities. And um, that is a little bit different than the ADU definition I mentioned earlier in that an ADU is clearly subordinate or kind of smaller than the primary structure. An ADU also can't be sold separately. It's, 
it's meant to be with, contained within the same ownership and the same lot. Um, we do have some regulations on accessory buildings, but specifically in the code currently, um, it does not allow dwelling units to be located within accessory buildings. And so um, we, we have provisions in our code about non-conforming buildings or uses. Um, and we get a, a decent amount of inquiries about whether um, a, a dwelling unit in the city is a legal dwelling unit or not. And they kind of fall into two different categories. So there's the legally non-conforming category, which may have been legal at one time, but is now prohibited. Um, they can predate the city's incorporation, for example, um, or may have had some sort of recognition over time, but current codes wouldn't allow them to be built in that form. And then we have illegal dwelling units, which were created by an owner or, or previous owner without any sort of approvals and in violation of city code. Um, and so both of those exist. And as staff occasionally were asked to determine whether a dwelling unit an accessory dwelling unit or, or a primary dwelling unit is legally non-conforming or, or legal or illegal. Um, and so in, in the staff report, it provided that checklist of how we go through. It's a pretty exhaustive process in order to find all the data needed to make that determination. But like I said, that's fairly rare. Um, we do get some of those inquiries that seems to have decreased recently. And now most of the inquiries around ADUs are, can I build one and, and how soon? Um, as an update from the 2016 um, discussions, I, I think a lot has changed in the past five years in terms of ADO data, not only in the metro area, but also statewide and nationwide. Um, Wheat Ridge is now uh, definitely an outlier among peer communities and, and communities in the state and country in terms of we don't allow ADUs and most, most people do in some capacity. Um, only three other cities in the metro area that were surveyed don't allow ADUs, and two of those are actually pursuing code amendments in 2022, so definitely in the minority there. Um, and, and since 2016, a lot of the original provisions um, around ADUs have been changed to be more permissive as well um, in other communities. And some communities that previously didn't allow them now allow ADUs. Um, statewide, same, same trends. Um, people are really recognizing that ADUs fulfill some, some need in their communities. And I, I'm not gonna go through this whole list because it's almost a page long of pretty small text, but um, there are some regional trends in terms of where ADUs are allowed, lot sizes, types of ADUs, the types of review. Um, and there's definitely a regional trend in the metro area of, of allowing, but allowing with some sort of building size restrictions of that nature. Um, and then nationally, Colorado, to be frank, is a little bit behind the national trends in terms of permissiveness towards ADUs and, and also potentially best practices as well. Some states actually have legislation that preempts local lo law to require communities to allow ADUs, and I think that's now up to seven or eight states. Um, Colorado does not have that law, but again, most communities do allow accessory dwelling units. And then there are some kind of best practices around ADU legislation that have developed over the past five years. Um, I, I think initially, and, and it definitely came up in the 2016 um, ordinance discussions, there were a lot of fears around ADUs and, and it, it was kind of an unfamiliar, but communities have had the chance to figure this out already and, and have had multiple years of permitting data and community feedback. Um, and so, you know, if we, decided as a city to pursue an ordinance, we would be building off of those years of institutional knowledge in other locations. Um, but both the American Planning Association and the AARP are advocates for ADUs and, and believe that they do play some role in, in serving housing needs and um, different housing types uh, and, and family types as well. So at this point, um, staff is recommending that you look into a code amendment uh, next year, but we, we do need to seek some policy direction. Um, and the reason why we're recommending the approach that I've outlined in the staff report is ADUs need, should be permitted in some capacity, but we don't need to simply just focus on those legally non-conforming or illegal ADUs that we know exist um, for a couple of reasons. I think there's been a pattern of support in the community over the past six years or so for ADUs. Um, it's now the norm for communities to allow new ADUs. 
and only addressing just a small portion of non-conforming or illegal dwelling units picks winners and losers in that it only focuses on those that already have the opportunity on their property of, of they either purchased or built or converted a structure. And so it's a really, really small percentage of the overall um, number. So with that, um, I think our intent is to perhaps recommend a follow-up study session to look over an ordinance framework um, and then establish some sort of ADU policy. But really this is at your behest and your direction. So um, with that, I'm happy to answer questions. I know there was a lot in the memo, so uh, let's get into it. Let's start with Ms. Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Scott, for all the work on this. Uh, kind of the way I see this process happening, and, and it was kind of mentioned in the memo too, is the way our SPR process went, where I'm hoping you walk out of here tonight with some good direction to bring us some draft ordinance, and then again, we look at that, and, and um, that also gives our community another opportunity to come to another study session to talk about how they feel about that draft ordinance, and then we're able to give you some more specific direction. So I actually have a seriously long list of direction that I would like to see move forward tonight. But before that, I get into that, I'll let everybody ask their questions. And one of mine is, um, what do we have for current lot coverage requirements? And, and would we change, would we need to look at changing that? Or would it just, would it stay the same? and ADUs would have to fall within the current lot coverage requirements? There's a pretty wide range of lot coverage allowances across the city. Um, R1 kind of being the lowest density at, I believe, 25%, and then R3 closer to 40%. Some of the mixed use districts are close to 80. So there is a really wide range, but I think for some of those districts with a really small overall percentage, especially some of those smaller lots, I guess we'd be looking at you for direction of whether that could be increased potentially or not. I mean, we already do allow accessory buildings on those properties, but those count towards that overall total. And so there are potentially some of the districts that have small percentages allowances where someone just couldn't add another building or, or addition to their property. Okay. And then um, do we, uh, so if, if as a municipality we allow ADUs, would, um, areas like it was it was mentioned that there were some some areas that were more suburban of nature that um, are more managed by HOAs so if we allowed those as a municipality would the HOAs still have the right to say to restrict them I think it depends on the HOA I mean the city we the city, like city staff doesn't look at HOA covenants if someone was going to come in with an application, it's kind of presumed that it would have been approved by the HOA. Um, so we couldn't prohibit an HOA from making a decision necessarily, I don't believe, unless you think otherwise can, but um, mm. any of our straight zone districts, which include neighborhoods with HOAs, I mean, they would be permitted by city code and then it would be up to the HOA to administer any sort of other restrictions that would be placed upon that property. I think Scott's right. I think an HOA could could likely be more restrictive, um, and that you know the city would have no say over that. Our the fact that we are more permissive in the zoning code doesn't mean that the HOA can't be uh, or couldn't be more restrictive and say our covenants say no accessory units. So as long as they were not less restrictive than what the municipal code is, then it would right. have to fall in line. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, I do like the way that you are approaching this at, uh, holistically with both the AD, ADUs that are um, legally non-conforming and illegal non-conforming, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> um, and I, it is a good point, right? If, if someone built something um, on, on their property and then they would get the opportunity to, to get it into a, a legal status, but then other people wouldn't have the opportunity. So basically breaking, breaking the rules would be a payoff there. So I do appreciate having, having this together and, and holistically. 
I just wanted to ask though about the, um, when we're looking at the current legal non-conforming and illegal ADUs that we have in our community, I, I saw that the approach would be that it would be a, um, it would be a, a per, 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 like you would look at, have to look at each place individually to try to kind of apply, knowing that if they, let's say if something, you know, if the square footage of one that's, that's cur currently in our community is larger than the one that will end up in our code, what is really the process? Would it, would it be that it, like what would it now become? It's a, it's a, a legal non-conforming and then we have the code, what it would, would it become? I think a good ordinance would allow some of those units that may not otherwise comply with current codes to still be legitimized in some capacity. And, and actually that was one of the recommendations of the APA and AARP was that we know that a lot of the pre-existing dwelling units may not meet all of the requirements, but there could be opportunities. And maybe there might be some s upgrades that have to be made. We haven't even touched on the subject of building code and utilities. I mean, there's a lot to, to what goes into this, but um, having some sort of pathway to at least legitimize th those units, and even though they may not meet current standards, they can still be considered legal accessory dwelling units. And, and how, do you how do you envision that pathway? Would it be something like you have to uh, you, you have to address six of the 10 standards, like you have to meet six of the 10 standards. And, and if you, if you don't, knowing that maybe size is not something, you know, making it something smaller wouldn't necessarily be viable, but then there's some other standard they would have to address. Would it be like, you'd have to address a certain amount of the standards or would it just be, we're looking at it. It's, it, there's no life and health safety issues at it. Um, it's been in operation like this for a certain, for X time, and we're just gonna say, okay, you're good. I think there can be a pretty wide range of that. I see Ken pulling the mic, so <laughs> go for it. <laughs> sure, um, there, there's such a, a disparate spread of, of fact patterns, uh, and it's, I, I mean, I think we've historically tried to be, you know, as reasonable as possible in terms of looking at those fact patterns, right, whether it be you know, some, in some fashion that the city, maybe a, we approved a separate electrical service, right? So that, so we had a role in creating that unit in some form or fashion. Uh, sometimes it's purely time, right? That uh, there's no, um, the, the, you know, it looks like the work has been there for 30 years and, you know, we evaluate that. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you two examples uh, because this, you know, comes up periodically for sure. Um, one would be a unit just around the corner on 32nd Avenue. Uh, was a two unit building, looked like by original construction, but had a converted unit in the basement that you know, looked like it had been there a good 20 years. This came up probably 10 years ago. Um, it you know, generally had a separate entrance, uh, had bedrooms, had living space, had a kitchen, um, had a separate uh, electrical service. A couple things it didn't have, right? It didn't have adequate egress windows in the bedrooms. Uh, and it didn't have a separate gas shutoff. Um, and there were a few other kind of electrical issues that, that were definitely safety issues from a code perspective. Uh, we worked with that property owner to get adequate egress windows to make sure that they both had separate gas and electric services for shutoff purposes and you know, made those official units. So that was the compromise that we reached based on the facts that were on the table for that unit. Uh, another example where we didn't come to that conclusion was a unit that um, looked like it had probably been fairly recently um, converted, um, didn't have adequate clear height in the living spaces, uh, didn't have any separate utilities, right? It was all kind of jerry-rigged sanitary sewer, water, all just kind of pulled over from the main house and there was no, you know, shepherd start offs for water, sewer, um, gas or electric. And we told them, this is an illegal unit, you need to convert it back. So there's just a, there's a whole spectrum of those different fact patterns. So I guess what I'm asking is, would the suggestion be when we're, when we're looking forward to um, moving down the road and, and actually writing this, would the suggestion be to 
be le to be less specific in this in these particular situations, so that there is the room for judgment and the room for saying like that looks like it was 30 years old, but we but you actually need egress windows because that's a life and health safety issue. Like, is it would it be best to be the least specific about that? I would say in the ordinances that I researched, they're not specific, okay. and I think that allows more flexibility. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Holtine. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I think just a point of clarity, when Council had our retreat uh, 150 years ago, it feels like, um, the reason we had separated out wanting to, to first look at existing structures that were non-compliant was that we have an existing problem. I mean, we have a lot of property owners with existing problems that they have these, a lot of times they purchase the properties, you know, they came with them. Um, so it, to me, it kind of felt like what we were talking about is we need to solve like a real problem in the community. And I'm just saying this to clarify, it wasn't to then not, I mean, the intent was then to follow that process with a, what is regulating new ADUs. So a lot of sort of my concerns and questions are similar to Ms. Hoppy's in that um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to figuring out how to make both work well in our community. And I mean, I have several constituents. I know, I know a lot of us have heard from specific constituents with specific issues. So, so as we move forward with this, you know, I appreciate Ken giving examples of different ways that the city's kind of use some flexibility. So to me, if we're gonna move forward with them together, is it, it's really important to me that we are giving as much allowance and leniency to bring our existing structures so that we're supporting people who are already living in our community to you know be able to maximize and realize their their property. So so if there's ways we can segregate out with like grandfathering clause or you know some sort of like you know you've got 24 months to work with us to bring it into compliance or whatever. Like I just want to make sure we're being really flexible as flexible as we can there to work with our existing neighbors. Um, and I just also want to remind everyone, this is a lot like the short-term rental process in which we're talking about a regulatory environment with people who have these non-conforming and illegal structures. And as we heard from the McMillans tonight, when you know that comes to light, like they actually are at risk of being kicked out of their homes or not being able to use it. So we're, we're working on a policy in which people who are impacted by it um, are nervous about coming forward. I had a couple people reach out to me that didn't want to give comment because they were worried that they would get outed. Um, so I just always want us to be mindful when we're doing a process that inherently doesn't allow everyone to come forward comfortably um, with that. And I think with that, I'm not going to get into too many specifics. I just kind of wanted to share my high level objectives around addressing our existing structures because you know one of the things we heard both in the live comments as well as online a lot of these are historic structures in our community and because they're not able to be legally recognized people aren't able to do the investments to, to keep them up and I I would hate for us to, to lose that and one of the concerns I have in like our, our two neighborhoods with the minimum lot square footage, like a lot of them are probably gonna exceed that if they're historic in nature. So those are just the places I wanna make sure we've got the flexibility um, that we can you know, keep, keep that condition as intact for our existing homeowners um, while, while looking forward to figuring out ways to um, uh, invite new ADUs into our city. Thank you. Ms. Dozman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would just like to thank staff uh, for this thorough um, presentation. And, and I really appreciated the research checklist because um, it gave me kind of an idea of the criteria and the questions that you would ask um, when we're discussing the non-conforming, whether they're illegal or illegal um, dwelling units. And I have to say, so this was one of the very first items <laughs> that I asked to be put on an agenda in 2017. So I am ecstatic that we are actually talking about this. Um, and at first, you know, I was very hesitant to be addressing the existing um, non-conforming legal and illegal ADUs while simultaneously trying to create a policy around um, regulating ADUs. And like 
Council Member Holteen um, kind of expressed that it, it, uh, my reasoning was along the same lines is, you know, we didn't want a punitive um, kind of policy in place. We wanted a, a situation in, in an environment in which we wanted to um, have people be comfortable in coming forward um, and, and admitting that they have these properties and maybe they bought it this way or, or, or whatever the situation is, um, is that we wanted them to be able to be brought into the light and um, <laughs> right? and and updated as necessary, and so I, I think, like Councilmember Holtine said, we have to be very mindful of that. Um, and I don't I don't know that we'll be able to have the same flexibility with um, the existing non-conforming ADUs while simultaneously trying to bring um, regulations to 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 future ADUs. So I guess I guess could you? provide a little bit more clarity on, on how, would it, would it just be a case-by-case -case basis? Do we have enough staff to handle that kind of a situation? Uh, can I start, Ken? Because I, sure. I think, um, I mean, this is a problem that's not unique to Wheat Ridge. Like, there are many, many communities that have had the same exact issue come up where there's ex existing non-conforming structures, existing illegal structures, and there are model ordinances out there that have allowed the flexibility to people that have existing buildings on their property to retain them and, and even remodel them and, and fix them up. And so I think there are, most communities go with one ordinance and they figure it all out at one time. And I think following a model that's been proven and, and has been really frankly figured out by now um, it is probably an appropriate thing while still allowing the flexibility that's desired by the community and constituents. So, so, but would it would it be addressed on a case by case basis, as far as like bringing those? Like, I, I, would you I, use this checklist and, and kind of? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you know, we think that the the checklist kind of approach, and maybe it's not perfect. It, you know, likely needs some refinement. We haven't dusted it off recently, but, um, you know, I think that's been, we, we felt that's been a, a reasonable approach. Um, again, we'll certainly look at fine tuning that as part of this process at Council's, you know, clear direction. Um, but I, I think, you know, I, I would encourage Council to, you know, be thoughtful in, in thinking about, you know, some sort of a, well, you've got 24 months to bring it into compliance, right? Because there's clearly some things out there that just are either A, substandard housing and, and shouldn't be, right? I mean, that, that's the chicken shack model, right? That was converted. And uh, th those aren't necessarily a good housing option, right? Um, and, the, you know, there's others that have a, a real good reason why they should be allowed to continue. And there's everything in between, right? There's some, one of your neighbors who converted a basement into a separate unit two months ago, right? I mean, that's out there too. And I mean, that's the reality, right? And I don't wanna, I, I would be remiss in not saying that I don't wanna be put in a position where we have to memorialize that illegal work that they called Scott up and Scott said, well, we're talking about it, we're talking about it, your council wants to talk about it, but, but we don't allow ADUs. And they said, okay, well, I'm gonna build one. So that's kind of some of the reasons why we think we need some discretion in that regard. Uh, thank you, Ms. Nossler Beck, online. Val, you're muted. I know, I can't figure out how to un- You're live now. You unmuted and then got muted again. There you are. Okay, I am really sorry about that. Um, uh, this is just to expand a little bit more on what both uh, Councilmember Holteen and Councilmember Dozman um, were discussing. Um, when we had the, the study session, um, or not the study session, the retreat um, long ago, uh, one of the issues that um, I think staff had brought up was um, going to be a challenge with the non, like figuring out our non-conforming um, buildings was that, um, you know, the staff time that that'll take. And um, I appreciated Councilwoman Dozman bringing up 
um, if we have the actual the staff resources to support um, the community. I think what we're kind of landing on here is, um, you know, where uh, property owners um, will have to um, opt in to get into regulation. We're going to probably end up asking them to come forward on this. Um, and so with that, my question is um, to what Councilmember Dozman was saying, do we have the staffing to support that? And I think that that requires us to also do um, some real work on um, outreach to let um, our our property owners know that this is something um, that will be coming down the pipe. Hi. Um, I mean, I think it depends a lot on the approach, right? I mean, from a staffing perspective, um, we're, you know, we're, we work on this issue um, as we speak, right? I mean, these issues come up and we evaluate them on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you know, Scott's memo gave you some scenarios where it's typically mm -hmm. a transactional thing, right? So a, a real estate transaction is pending or, or about to be pending and someone calls up one of the parties, new owner, old owner, real estate agent, appraisal, uh, and that's typically the context under which we, we look at these. Um, I mean, if it were, and, and we feel very well uh, situated to be able to handle that. Um, if, you know, there's a couple different other scenarios that might play out, right? I mean, if, if there were direction to say, you know, hear ye, hear ye, uh, come one, come all, if you think you have an illegal unit, come in and, um, you know, we're, we're, we're here to help sort of thing. Uh, I don't know what that looks like, right? I mean, that's obviously probably going to be more of a staff impact than the former scenario or the existing scenario. So I think it, or if there's some sort of a, um, you know, grace period where, you know, in the next 12 months, you can come in and if there's reasonable evidence that you had a second unit on your property that may or may not be legal, we're going to figure that out for you. Again, that that's a different fact scenario. So I think you know, whether it, it depends on how actively uh, and under what time frames, if any, that council would wish to, you know, ask us to kind of get the word out on, on handling existing units. Because we're, we're handling them right now um, in, in a variety of ways. So it would just be if you want to change that status quo, which you can, um, to, yeah. to, you know, create a different paradigm. I, I guess what I'm um, trying to uh, get at here is, you know, we had um, some people speak at the at public comment today about how, um, you know, they didn't know they weren't in compliance and found out through, you know, pulling building permits and things like that. Um, I would say that, you know, if there's an option um, as the council thinks through how we do this um, for us to, you know, do some work on the front end to provide some, you know, like a, a year long amnesty or something to come forward and get into compliance on a checklist. But then also um, for those property owners that may just not have been looped in that there also could be some um, some some steps to move forward um, if a property is brought up after that specific time or something. And I, I realize we're really getting into the the sausage making of it all, but um, I want to make sure that if we're going back to do this, that we're we're really um, being intentional about making this uh, really really helpful to the property owners right now um, that are in Wheat Ridge and that are either looking to you know, stay here and um, make improvements to their homes or to potentially sell their homes. Um, so that's that's where my head's at. And Ken, thanks for thanks for explaining some of those options. Uh, thank you, Ms. Weaver. Thanks so much for all the comments that have been said so far. Um, I. I agree with everything that's been said. My concern is that it's not a punitive model and it's more of a optimistic model because ha having uh, 
you know, had similar experiences to, to some of the comments that were made earlier. Um, it's really a difficult position to ask people to come forward, knowing that um, you not only, you, you might be outed, as you said, um, but you also might be punished. And, and, and so as I'm listening to all these comments, I'm, I'm thinking about sort of the 100-year-old farm that I live in and, and what, what it would take for, for me to, to want to come in and, and, and talk about all these things. And, and so I think as we're, as we're, we're considering this, um, I'd really like to make sure that we do come up with some specifics because it's it's really not and and I understand that this this has to happen, you know, in terms of permitting and all of these different things, but but figuring out a situation where people can come in and win, or they know that they're not going to, <laughs> um, by having a hey this is this is the specific list of things that we're going to ask that you have, um, so that so that one doesn't feel like, hey, if I come in and ask the question and I know that the city's been looking at m me on aerial photography and things like that, that I'm not going on a watch list. Um, and, and this has been, you know, sort of a perception in the past, I think, that, that um, you know, whether it's been code enforcement or whatever, but that there's this sort of watch list of, of bad behavior, if you will. And so, um, and, I, and I'm not saying that there is any one person or, or, or something that is at, at fault for that. I'm saying it's a, it's a perception that I think has happened over time through different things and policies. So, so really, to, and, and thank you, Scott, for sort of bringing all of this up um, and, and the research you've done. I, I just feel like it needs to, to really, I mean, I, mean I, I know that we're tiptoeing through this, and I, and I do think we are going to have to get to sausage making and really in specifics on well, what, what is nonconforming and what are we okay with, and, and so that, that people can, can make decisions um, to the point of, of the folks that came in and spoke earlier, uh, because I, I know that there's a lot of people who would like to make those decisions or know that no is the answer. So, um, my, my, thought is that all of these things are important, but really creating a positive way rather than a, um, because what I'm hearing right now, I was sort of like, okay, would I feel comfortable walking in and, you know, talking about this stuff? And, and then I thought, well, no, I'd really like to see a list of, if I'd like to do this, in my, you know, if I'm thinking about doing this, or if I know that I'm never going to be able to do it, I just kind of want to know the answer. So, thanks for. Uh, Ms. Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, you know, I, I hear what you guys are saying about that. I think part of the point of being flexible is giving people the opportunity to, is giving people the opportunity to come into conformity. Right, and so if, if we have a list of 25 things, and if, if we say, you know, um, what is, Arvada says the size restriction is 40%, can be up to 1,200 square feet depending on lot size. So if, if we have this whole list of this is where your ADU has to be, then what happens is if we're not flexible to be able to bring those people into, com into legalities, is that then they're just illegally going and bumping down the road still. So I, so I guess I would say that I think it's important that we still have a little bit of flexibility in that. Um, what we don't really see much in this memo, which I'm assuming when you guys come back to study session, should you get the direction that I'm hoping we'll get today, is that you'll have maybe a little bit more of an outlined process of this is, this is what we're looking for specifically on already existing this is what we, if someone wants to build something new, these are the X, Y, Zs, one, two, threes of what you have to do. I think that's the, the intent. Um, this was really meant to be an overview and then tonight we were kind of hoping to get some direction and um, whether that's to follow regional best practices or if you have something more specific in mind. Um, I, I guess I would wanna maybe address some of the comments that have been floating around about um, maybe the culture of fear that has been happening. So 
I don't know, I don't want to speak too much on this, but I would say like having accessory dueling units be legal is a very different framework than having something, our current status quo, which is they're not legal. And so someone would be, I think, more likely to come forward to the city to pull a permit or say, hey, this is an ADU, if they're allowed, then their status quo of them not being allowed, and then kind of potentially contacting a staff person to see, like, is the, do the research checklist. But if it's allowed, then they're more likely to kind of come forward and, and be legitimate and above board in terms of renovations and things of that nature. Mr. Olm. Thank you. I, I appreciate uh, staff coming with us, uh, coming up with these um, documents and the criteria, and also thank thank you to uh, uh, city council members that have tried to bring this up. Um, so my my questions looking at this is uh, uh, my my first, uh, and, and thank you, Mr. Johnstone, for actually um, already answering my question about the egress windows. Uh, my my biggest concern is going to be life safety that um, that we we can't we can't compromise on uh, the life safety um, I don't foresee that the the city is going to be patrolling and looking at you know who has an ADU or not but once the city is aware of it you know and that's maybe a question for for the attorney I don't think the city can just ignore that issue if it's a life safety you know that or or, or that maybe they don't even know what it is that they have to investigate and see is there a life safety issue um and i i think that's something that we can't compromise as a city on but as far as you know the size of you know maybe of a, of a basement um i think that just depends uh, on that size there has to be a little bit of flexibility if someone has already made something um and perhaps you'd have to look at the, so I, I think a little bit of flexibility on that. Um, I do think that br having these ADUs might eliminate some past problems that we had. I won't get into specifics, but just to say that I think there was an opportunity in the past where perhaps someone could have done an ADU had it been permitted, but because they couldn't, the only alternative was to do a flag lot. And so I think there's some benefits of, um, uh, of having the ADUs um, and uh, I, th I think um, I, I, the other question I have is about the, um, the parking, and that's kind of my last question. I know we can't regulate the number of on-street parking, but I know the intent of the code is to not have any one individual monopolize the public right away. And so um, I guess, you know, just a careful look at the uh, how many off-street parking can we re reasonably have? And then my last question is the time frame. And once there's a, uh, I guess, a, a finding uh, by the maybe the building official that there's a life safety issue and things have to be brought up to code, I don't know. If, I think I may have heard a year, um, but in this in this market of construction, I think a year might be unreasonable um, it's really tough to get contractors and so I, I would just ask staff really take a look what would be reasonable to get contractors and I'm not sure a year would be sufficient but on that same side if it is a life safety issue then that ADU could not function of having people in it if it's a life safety issue so however long that takes perhaps it's one to two years um, that person would not be able to use that ADU as a, as a sleeping quarters, I guess. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Holtine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I know we have a long list of specific uh, uh, provisions that have been brought forth, and I just want to check with Council. Do we feel like we've given enough direction to staff on the leniency and sort of parameters of our existing structures, and are we ready to, to transition into talking about um, are others okay so uh do you I just want to kind of get a sense do you want to just go through like the list and 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 hit on those does that sound okay to staff all right roll up your sleeves people uh where where are they allowed is the first question so i think are you asking are they allowed in general that's the 
ADUs permitted. So I guess the question would be, are we, should we perhaps ask for a consensus to proceed with the code change to allow ADUs in Wheat Ridge, including provisions for new ADUs, as well as provisions to conditionally allow non-conforming or illegal dwelling units to achieve legalization. And once we start there, then maybe we can go through Okay, that. so question number three, do we have consensus to, to move on that? We do. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the first issue brought forward is uh, where will uh, giving staff direction on where to allow ADUs? I think that um, I personally feel that we should do in all residential zones, including our mixed use. Um, and, and also, I was thinking, um, is, so mixed use commercial doesn't really have any residential in it, right? Mixed use neighborhood does, though. So I feel like we should include mixed use neighborhood as long as if, if the primary use is also residential. So that was kind of something that I had heard in there. But um, that's, so that's my opinion on residential zone. Mr. Stites? Um, I guess my, my only issue would be R1 zone. Um, what could we do there? Or is that, would that be allowed there? You mean not allow them in or R1? Or not allowing R1 zoning? <clears throat> what, I guess, I guess my I question. See, I feel like they should be allowed in R1, so, um, so I wouldn't support not allowing them in R1. Okay. My, my thought is, is the people who are going to give the most pushback on this are going to be people that live in an R1 zone that like their density the way it is. Um, I know in like R2, you can, you can start having duplexes and things like that, where all of a sudden I, I feel like maybe an ADU kind of feels a little bit more like a duplex. So I don't know that I would, I would prefer that they weren't allowed in R1. I guess I would have to point out the, um, the surveys, both surveys, 2018, 2021, the, um, the Let's Talk, all four of the Let's Talk reports and say, and, and actually it's in here somewhere, um, and just point out that the, the R1 folks are supportive and, um, here it is. So like on page three, East Wheat Ridge, it ranked two out of nine items. Um, Bel Air, two out of eight. Lepa Manor, there are only 13% were opposed or strongly opposed. And these are just from the Let's Talks. These aren't even from the scientific um, surveys. So I guess I would say R1 is somewhere where people do want them. Well, would R1 have the minimum lot coverage to allow for an ADU, or would that like just look different as far as like size goes, like a percentage, right? Um, so R1 lots, and by the way, there's multiple R1. There's R1, just R1, which is typically West Wheat Ridge, um, and then there's R1A, R1B, R1C. R1C is almost all of East Wheat Ridge, so if we did get direction to allow in certain districts, we would probably need more spe specificity, but specific to R1, like the large lot. These are very large lots. They have to be a third of acre or larger. So um, I guess the building coverage could potentially be an issue at 25%, but at the same time, those lots are also the largest and could potentially absorb additional accessory buildings for a lot of the smaller lots and be less impactful because they're, it's such a large lot that you're not gonna be, feel crowded on there. Um, so I, I think there's and ADUs don't necessarily mean an additional building. Correct. It could be above your garage. It could be in the basement. It could be, yeah. Okay. So that's why, like, the lot, the maximum lot coverage kind of protects those smaller, like, R1C lots from being just all building because they would probably have to go above their garage or in their basement. Okay, I've got the Councilor Hutchinson, uh, uh, Councilor Weaver, and then uh, Councilor Ohm. Thank you, Mayor. I think whatever is decided needs to be citywide because I did see on Let's Talk, Applewood area did not want ADUs. So that's not okay, you know, just, you know, the east side of Wheat Ridge start getting, doing the ADUs, but over west, they don't want them. If we're gonna do this, it needs to be citywide. Um, and then uh, Councilor Weaver. 
I can come back there. Uh, the Councilor Ohm. I think the, the things to tie into the, the R1 or any of the other areas is, number one, yes, are we, is it going to be allowed an accessory ADU, which it sounds like probably won't. Um, and then I might have some concern if we strictly prohibit um, not in, say, like a, an R1C would that person then become an applicant and request a zone change to an UN. Uh, Councillor Dozeman. Uh, thank you. That was right around along the same thought that process that I was having. Um, it, it would be a, it would be a, a private property owner, you know, decision on on whether they would be able to have or, or would pursue having a, an ADU. And, and I, but I do agree that it should be um, citywide. And, and I I think that because this has been such a a, a common theme amongst the last six years on our resident surveys and a concern, especially um, it, within the affordability. I, I, I think that it should be allowed in all residential zones. Um, and then, you know, it, it's going to have to be taken on a case by case basis as far as like lot coverage at that rate. Uh, Councilor Weaver, we're back at you. If you have, okay, we'll get to scratch you out and go to Miss Hoppy and then Miss Holtine. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I would also just like to mention that <clears throat> our one C is is very highly concentrated in in my district and so i absolutely would want to make sure that they are allowed to be um, a, a part of this process if we restricted our one c's then that'd be the majority of my district and i have a lot of people in my district actually i feel like a couple of the comments even that were online were from district one and so i have, I have a lot of people in my district that talk to me often about when are we going to get to where adus are allowed so I would not want to cut them out. Uh, Councilor Holteen. Thank you. I also support uh, a citywide approach to this uh, and two compelling reasons. One is uh, just a reminder, uh, it would impact our uh, existing ADUs. Uh, so if we don't allow them in R1, then we're uh, taking those off the, the plate unless we decide there's some flexibility. But more than that, I'm just, I'm compelled by the fact that what we're hearing from people is that the reason we're pursuing these is that it is allowing them for multifamily, intergenerational living situations. It's a part of, you know, our our values as a city is allowing people to stay on their properties for long periods of time. Um, and in the story I hear again and again and again is that this is about allowing aging parents to um, co cohabitate without actually having to share a structure. Um, and then I, I have two of my constituents who reach out to me in the last couple of months who have older children with special needs who can't live completely independently. And um, if they can't make this happen here, they're gonna have to move outside of Wheat Ridge so that they can um, continue to uh, age with their kids. So I'm, I'm in support of that. And uh, if no one else has any comment, uh, I'd like to ask for a consensus that we support this citywide. Okay. And in all residential balance. zoning, mm -hmm. including mixed use neighborhood or? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Val. Val is reminding us to look at her. <laughs> Sorry, Val. <laughs> okay. So the next question in front of us is if we would be allowing um, detached ADUs, um, and then it says detached is one question, and then it says attached or basement. So I'm gonna go ahead and conjoin, like, make that one conversation topic. I just ask for consensus to um, allow detached ADU, ADUs, attached and basement ADUs. Okay, consensus there. All right, the next question in front of us is about administrative review for uh, permitting them. Any discussion? All right, I'd like to ask for a consensus that we allow administrative review for ADUs. Okay, we have consensus on that. Okay, the next question in front of us is uh, requiring notice to neighbors. I'd like to ask for a consensus that we do not uh, require notice to neighbors. Do not. So the, uh, all right, so it looks like there's some need for a discussion on that. Can I ask, do we um, require that if I were to build, if I'm gonna build a garage, do we require that I notice my neighbors that I'm building a garage? 
No, we don't require notice for any development on a single lot private property. If I'm adding an addition, like a master bathroom or a master bedroom, am I required to notice my neighbors for that addition that I am building? No, and regardless of size, you don't have to notice. Thank you. Do I have to give notice to my neighbors if I rent out one of my rooms? No. Unless it's a short-term rental and then yes. <laughs> okay, is there, is there any discussion on this from anyone? Is this discussion? Discussion. Okay, Ms. Uh, Hutchinson and then Mr. Stites. Thank you. Um, notice to neighbors to me is something that involves privacy also. So um, it's up in the air about how big these ADUs can be. And it looks like some of them can be like a regular another house. So what's the setbacks and how tall are they going to be? And I think we need to figure out, you know, um, depending. It sounds like they can be any size almost, depending on lot size. So it could be another single family house there. I think of an ADU, you know, uh, they, they build those little houses, you know, some of them are even on wheels, you know. So there's got to be, you know, some type of consideration for neighbors. I know ADUs, it's, the thing is you think you're going to have your family, your parents there. I don't think that's really all that's going to happen. So I think consideration of neighbors is very important. So not everybody lives on like an acre. So, Mr. Stites, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I agree with Ms. Hutchinson. Uh, you, you, Scott, you did say that we do require, if it was going to be a short-term rental, that we give notice. Um, and this is, especially in like an R1 neighborhood, this is changing the character of that neighborhood considerably. You're building another structure there that's going to bring in more people into that neighborhood. There should be some notice given to the neighbors. Ms. Dozman. I was going to say that because um, it was uh, it was said that we have to give notice for SDRs, and I was reminded of that, and so uh, that is what I believe would change the character of the neighborhood. Um, not necessarily having an accessory dwelling unit, um, so I would change my consensus on that matter. Can I clarify my comment on SDRs? That's actually up to the owner to voluntarily notify. That's actually where council landed in the ordinance. It's not the city notifying. Um, so I, that is a little bit of a difference, but there is a neighbor notice involved with starting the operation of an STR. Um, let me remind you, we had a, a discussion about this, uh, I, I think at council, whether are we, if we, if we have a notice to neighbors, is in there an opera, is it, does it setting up a dynamic that that means something? Um, you know, and if we've got an administrative process and not a public hearing, that you're not, it sort of sets you up to think, well, I, oh, I can, I got this notice, but what am I going to do with it? Okay, I've got, uh, Dozeman spoke, I've got Hoppy next, and then Weaver. Uh, <clears throat> I believe Ms. Holtine's going to re-ask for the consensus. Oh, I was actually going to make a point. Um, so if anyone else has something else to add. Well, Ms. Weaver. Um, just to follow up on, on the mayor's point, I, and on what Mr. Seitz said, I'm, it's not that I'm, I'm, I'm for the noticing, because if, there, if noticing does absolutely nothing and people have no... Um, way to share an opinion about that, then, then the noticing it seems, uh, doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so it's not that I am not supportive of not noticing. However, I am, you know, this, this is changing the nature of density in our neighborhoods. And, and it, it, there's just something that, um, uh, We've had a lot of conversations around this in Wheat Ridge, and and um, while this is putting it in the owner's hands, um, which I, I think that's a, a good move, um, there's there's a question in me that that is, um, 
I, I do think it should be citywide, and at the same time, I go back to all of these neighborhood discussions we've had on the right thing in the right place, and I'm, I'm, there is something that, that I can't quite verbalize about um, not noticing and, and, and changing this regulation to allow ADUs in all zones districts. Thanks. Mr. Ohm? I have one question for Mr. Cutler. So on an R2, um, if that owner decided to scrape their house and build a duplex, would they have to provide, because they'd be increasing the density, would they have to provide notice to the neighbors? No, they wouldn't. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Olteen? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, so I, I really don't feel good about notice on things where people can't take action on it. And I just think about if we are putting in a notice requirement, um, let's just say I decide uh, I'm gonna build one in my backyard because my aging father needs to live with me. And then all of a sudden my, my right to do that becomes a discussion with my neighbors who decide they're not comfortable with it. And, um, and then that pits me against my neighbors. And I think that is not a position, I try and avoid putting our neighbors in those positions as often as possible because that is contradictory to the quality of neighborhoods that we care about as good neighbor. So I think I, I will say I would support stricter restrictions on what people can build and to not require them to have to work with their neighbors to build it. Um, if we're gonna allow it, it should be a use by right and we shouldn't be putting our neighbors in positions where they have to get um, you know, permission or enthusiasm from their neighbors about what they need to do to you know, take care of their own families. And, and to me, that's what this ADU policy is doing. So I definitely strongly support um, not doing neighbor, neighbor notice. Mr. Stites. Um, you might have convinced me on that one. Let me ask one question real quick. Um, since Mr. Ohm brought it up earlier, the flag lot, because this is, it's not the same, but it's similar. Um, that administrative process, is there a public notice at all for that? There is not for flag lots if it's a, an administrative subdivision, which means three lots or fewer are involved. Okay, I'm just thinking about the controversy that that stirred up uh, the last time that happened, and this may end up being a similar type of thing. So. Sweever? I'm just wondering, uh, per Mr. Ohm's comment, um, what's the difference then between an R2, which is what would be allowed in a duplex, and what we're talking about? That's a very good question, and uh, could go on about that for a while, but um, a duplex is, is a different ownership model than an accessory dwelling unit in a primary structure. A duplex um, has, they're both complete separate dwelling units that can be sold separately. They have separate utilities. They have firewalls between them. I mean, there are two owners, two addresses, and, a, and sometimes even a split lot where the builder can sell off either side to separate property owners. And ADU is on one lot that's owned by one person and often will have the same utility connections um, and it can never be sold separately. And it's always going to be smaller than um, the primary structure. So an ADU is probably less impactful than a duplex. Why is it always smaller? I'm just curious. Because I, I, I put a much larger addition onto an 800 square foot house. And it's not an ADU, but I'm just saying, is that a rule that an ADU is always smaller than the primary dwelling? That's common practice and accessory, the word implies that it is smaller and, and most codes require that the ADU is significantly smaller or at least kind of up to the size of the primary structure, but no larger. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and ask for a consensus that we do not require uh, neighbor notice. And Val has, uh, yep, she's. Okay, we have consensus there. Okay, and I, uh, so the next thing on the chart here says all residential zones. We actually already addressed that. I misinterpreted AD, ADUs permitted. Um, so then uh, the next topic of discussion is minimum lot size. I'd like to ask for a consensus that we don't require a minimum lot size because we have our, we already have our lot coverage that um, is going to cover us with that. 
Okay, we have consensus there. Thank you. Uh, the next consensus item is uh, re uh, requiring any off-street parking. I'd like to, uh, does anyone have any discussion on this? Ms. Hobby? Mm -hmm. I, I do see in the memo that the, the national, um, kind of like the, the, the way that the national way is going and, and the suggestion from the AARP was parking requirements and, to, and that they can be burdensome for, for like ADUs. However, I do feel that um, from a lot of the different conversations that um, I've had with people in our community on a lot of different things, parking is important and STR, it was really important. So even though it's, it's kind of going against the kind of the, the nation, nationwide um, suggestions, I, I think that we should allow one um, off, that we should require an, one off street parking. Ms. Dozman. Yeah, so I, I would agree with that point, um, but I, I think about the property that I live at and uh, how it, it, there's one driveway, right? And you can fit one car in it um, and all of the other occupants of the household are parking on the street. Um, and I think a lot of our residential areas um, in District 4 are like that unless it's bigger lots um, with multiple driveways. So, um, and I mean, a lot of the houses on Pierce, same thing. They have one driveway, one car, can't fit any other additional cars in um, off-street parking. So I think that that might become a bit of an issue of bringing like non-conforming structures into conformance. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I feel like I, I have flexibility on the parking thing. I just felt like, you know, this, what we're doing tonight is, is giving, you know, direction just to get to where we get to another one. And so I, I thought that, well, if we put it in there tonight, and then if we hear a lot from people that that's, that will restrict them from being able to have an ADU and it's important to them, then you know we could take it out at another time too. It's kind of how I felt with that. Uh, before I go to question, I had a question. What, how do we regulate parking in residential areas now? Excuse me. Our standard for a single family lot is that we require, if there's on street parking available, they're required to have a minimum of two off street spaces. Um, they can be in a garage, they can be in a driveway as long as they meet our dimensional standards. If there's not on street parking, on, then we require four spaces. Again, it can be a driveway, it can be a garage, but uh, that's, the, that's the standard for, for single family residential districts. Thank you. Um, so I've got Mr. Stites and then Mr. Ohm. And Thank you, sir. I'm wondering if we can have two criteria. Can we have a um, existing criteria where if it's a non-conforming that we have now, maybe we don't have that parking requirement, but if we're somebody's going to build a new one, they do have that parking requirement? Is that something that we can? As I understand the way that we're, the way that we're looking at it is what we're looking at right now is for anything new. So it's not, it's not necessarily what would, what would be going to someone who's existing already. Uh, Mr. Ohm, and then Ms. Nossler back. Um, I think on the lines of parking, you know, perhaps, I know this is a unique situation, perhaps we could have some type of, um, uh, like a compromise or, or, or the, you know, the, the planning staff could look at, you know, each property a little bit differently. I fortunately have, uh, a big driveway and I could park several vehicles on it, but there are areas uh, in Wheat Ridge and even in District 2 where there's just a single. And so I don't think it could be a one size fits all. I think um, where, I think what would be reasonable is if, uh, you know, I have a lot such that I could provide an extra vehicle, um, so be it. If it's a situation where the property has a, uh, make perhaps a single driveway, then that would maybe not, maybe that wouldn't be a requirement. Um, it's really about, I think what the concerns are is really trying to fit the character of the neighborhood. Um, I, I think if we could add any type of off-street parking, it would go a long way to the surrounding neighbors and residents. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Nossler back online. Um, am I muted still? No, you're good. Great. Um, 
I'm unmuted to tell you that, Mayor, you asked my question and so did you, Council Member Stites. Thank you. Thank you. Just the way the brain works. Okay, Ms. Hutchinson. Thank you. I think it is important to have off-street parking. Um, most people who rent, they, there's a couple people who are at least together. And we know by the high rise at 38th and Upham, there are cars parking in the school parking lot. Um, there's not every neighborhood has parking on the street. So um, I think it's important if they're gonna have an accessory dwelling unit that they do provide parking off the street so that um, the cars just aren't starting to line up. Thank you. Ms. Holteen. Uh, so I'd like to go ahead and uh, ask for a consensus that we uh, move forward with requiring um, off, one off street parking. Is that Ms. Hoppy? What? Uh, wait, wait, I'm not, but wait, there's more. Uh, that would require one off street parking um, and then also give directive to staff to bring back some options on some flexible models um, when we're looking specifically at our existing ADUs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so our next question is about requiring owner occupancy for an ADU. Um, I'd like to ask for consensus that we do require that. Um, sorry, the next topic is whether or not we require owner occupancy for an ADU. Um, and I am seeking consensus on it because uh, every other community does require that, but I'm seeing uh, Ms. Desmond looks like she'd like to. So I just want a little bit of clarity on that because for like short-term rentals, we allow for a owner-occupied home with, with a, an, an STR and then a non-owner-occupied home with an STR. So if somebody in our community had a rental and had a long-term renter in one unit and then a short-term rental in the other unit, they would, that, that would not be allowed. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. Just clarify, our, our recommendation is that if there were to be uh, ADUs allowed that one of the two units be owner-occupied. So it doesn't have to be the primary, it could be the ADU, but one of the two is owner-occupied. So just, that's, yeah, that was, that's, that's our recommendation. That's, that's, that's common. Yeah. I know that uh, Scott was speaking that, you know, some communities along the Front Range are on their second or third iteration of of ordinances in this regard, and I know that Jefferson County had previously required both to be owner-occupied and no one built ADUs because that was too uh, onerous. It's complicated, but it's got a lot to do with whether you could get financing for it if all of them were required to be owner-occupied. Okay, so I'd like to ask for a consensus uh, that we require at least uh, one of the units to be owner occupied. Okay. okay. Okay, the next topic is ADU size restriction. Um, I'm going to just first ask if anyone has any discussion points on this because this Ms. Hoppy? Yeah, I do. I actually did quite a bit of research today and, and did some math. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of different. The communities around us do um, do this ADU size restriction differently. It varies a lot. Um, what I'm looking at is actually, I think, was the last page. It's attachment two. It's the last page of the packet, the graph. So I started looking at, what I did is I went online to see what homes were for sale in District 1 and to see what their square footage size was and then ran the 40%. The so there's a lot that are like not to exceed 40% of the primary home. And then there are some that are like not to exceed 30% of the primary home and 50%. So I, I ran some square footage numbers and then um, had a discussion um, with my husband. As most of you know, we owned the construction company for 18 years and he built several ADUs um, down in West Denver. So a two car garage is typically 400 to 450 square feet is what you're getting if you're building an ADU on top of a two car garage. A one car garage 
you're getting anywhere from 200 to 250 square feet if you're building it on top of your garage. And then um, not building in a garage and just building a standalone unit to get a two bedroom. So like some of these have a maximum of two bedrooms. Some of them have a maximum of one bedroom. You know, 700 to 800 square feet, you can get a, a decent size AD, a decent well-planned ADU in that. So as I did some of the some, <laughs> some of the math, you know, we have two bedroom, two bath homes in Wheat Ridge that are 732 square feet. And 40% of that, if, if the restriction was not to exceed 40% of the primary structure, would only be 292 square feet. So, um, and, and realistically, if you're, if you're building something, um, you really want to be able to be for at least at like 400 square feet. So, um, or close to 400 square feet. So that same house that's for sale for 732 square feet, at 50%, they would only be able to build a 366 square foot ADU. Um, one can assume this is probably on one of our smaller lots, so it would definitely have to be something that have to go above the garage. But the, what, I, what I suggest, this is my suggestion, is that I think our, we should do our ADU size restriction at 50%, not to exceed 50% of the primary structure <clears throat> up to 1,000 square feet total. And so here's another example of, and this is also in District 1, but it's a three bed, two bath, and it's 3,386 square feet. 50% of that would be an ADU of 1,693 square feet. So that's why I think it's important that we have both pieces a maximum of 1,000 square feet, and then we say 50%, not to exceed 50% of the primary structure. I actually kind of wanted to go 60%, but um, I debated a lot today and decided to, to suggest 50%. So my suggestion for that is 50% of the primary structure, not to exceed 1,000 square feet. Uh, Ms. Holtine and then Ms. Weaver. Thank you. Um, before going into all the uh, fabulous calculus that Ms. Hoppy has, um, how much, it, it seems to me, especially if we're talking about detached, that we start to run into some of the like restrictions on how much of the lot coverage there can be. And I'm just wondering if, if Scott or Ken can kind of speak to, you know, how that, how we kind of rub up against the lot size versus what we're looking at for like our calculations for allowable size. Um, I think lot size will continue to be a limiting factor, um, especially for some of those lots that are already pretty tight. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I mean, we put height in there as a possibility of allowing potentially um, dwelling units above existing garages or that sort of thing. And that kind of gets rid of the building coverage factor because you're repurposing an existing structure. You're not actually adding footprint or lot coverage. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, for R1C, for example, most of District 1 is limited at 40%, same at R3, so that will always be a factor, and that would be a factor if someone wanted to build a detached garage as well, so it's not just limited to ADUs, it would be any sort of addition or, or detached structure that, that's a limiting factor for sure. Ms. Weaver? I, I, if I oh, could just Ken, add. go ahead. Sorry, Mayor, thank you. Um, I, I would add a couple things to that. Just uh, it may uh, inform what type of an ADU they choose to, uh, to choose to build, right? Because I think we think lot coverage still matters in terms of you know neighborhood character. So uh, uh, two comments. One, you know maybe that means they're doing a um, a pop top of the garage, right? To get a small ADU on top of their garage versus a standalone structure. And there is still always you know the variance opportunity. So. Uh, that, you know, ADUs would be eligible to make application for a lot coverage variance, uh, possibility, possibly as well. Ms. Weaver? Um, I really appreciate both comments. Um, I really appreciate what Ms. Hoppy said, and I would add, I would ask that we add that, um, like in my case, I had an 800 square foot house and then built an addition that I mostly live in the addition. And um, so that, that one could 
have the, the new structure be their primary residence if they chose to then make the accessory dwelling unit the original <clears throat> smaller house. I, maybe that's assumed, but I just wanted to say that out loud because you brought up that, that exact point. Ms. Hutchinson. Thank you. Um, I just have a question about building on top of the garage. Um, I know a lot of houses have bedrooms up above the garage and things. Uh, what's the issue of carbon monoxide when you build above a garage? I hear it's out there. Uh, it's, it's a good question, Ms. Hutchinson. Um, I can't speak um, specifically to the carbon monoxide, but I know that if you're going to have habitable living space above a garage, that there's going to be certain fire separation requirements, which you know is, is there for principally fire safety because there's you know, something more combustible in the, in the first floor than, than would normally be the case. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in terms of odors or carbon monoxide, I think I can't speak to that. I just know that there, there is a building code requirement for additional fire separation. Okay. Okay, Ms. Weaver and then Ms. Hoppy. Just another quick question. Is there a minimum? A m minimum. Minimum size? A minimum size, yes. Mm -hmm. And does it bump into the tiny home stuff? That's not super common. I think a lot of minimum size for dwelling units is dictated by the building code. There's got to be right like a certain square footage for a bedroom certain square like clearance i don't know what that is but at some point the building code wouldn't allow you to build smaller than a certain size i just don't know what that number is miss hoppy oh uh, I, I i'd like you... to ask for consensus to um have our adu size restrictions to be 50 percent of the primary home not to exceed 1,000 square feet. Okay, we have consensus on that. Can I ask a clarifying question on that? Um, that, so some communities choose to also have different restrictions when they're basement units because that's kind of following the existing footprint of a house. Would this same size restriction potentially apply to a basement unit, which may actually be the same size I guess it would be 50%, but I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to clarify whether that's specific to a detached or if it's also involving a detached or above floor ADU. That's, that's a really good question because the house, the house I'm in is exactly the same square footage. Yeah. If, and it's so it does say if attached must be less than primary unit, but can, so let's say, let's look at Golden, for example. They say not to exceed 50% of primary or 800 square feet, whichever is less if attached must be less than primary unit but can be over 800 square feet. So I guess we could put in there saying if it, well, see, if attached could also, if, yeah. Like, so I guess we could just do a basement carve out. Yeah, like if there's a basement in a 1,200 square foot house, that's over 1,000 square feet, but theoretically there could be 1,200 square feet of living space down there now. Right. Like how would that? Could we just, uh, just do the basement? The basement? What? Except yeah, basements. except basements. Is there a consensus for that, though? Okay. Okay, uh, our next topic is height. Uh, uh, does anyone have any discussion items on height that they would like to? This is kind of all over the place, so. I just think that 25 feet is, is a reasonable amount, and that, that's, especially if we're talking if it's a standalone unit, I would hope that it wouldn't even be as big as 25 feet, but if we're down, going above a garage, then 25 feet allows, allows for that. So that's why I think 25 feet. And just to clarify, all of this would be subjected to all the existing height restriction setbacks, all of, I mean, I know it's an obvious yes, but. Yes, although current, um, because we don't allow ADUs, our current accessory building height standards are much lower than 25 feet, a maximum of 15 feet for a garage and 10 feet for a shed. So it would be a change to the code in that you would be allowing 
a specific carve out for accessory drilling in is to exceed the existing accessory building height, but that would then allow for that unit to be built above an existing garage that would currently be between 10 to 15 feet tall. So yes, otherwise it would, all buildings have to meet the setback requirements for the zone districts, unless you chose for those to be different. Great, so uh, I'd like to ask for a consensus of a 25 foot height restriction. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, we're almost, we're almost there. Uh, now I am seeking a consensus that we limit the number allowed per lot to one. Sorry, I didn't understand that. Um, sorry, <clears throat> I'm reading off the chart here. Uh, that I'm seeking a consensus that we limit the number allowed per lot to one. One, one per lot. One, one ADU per lot. One ADU per lot. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want yep. to. So, and it looks like Val wants to say something about okay, that. Okay, Ms. Nossler back. Um, I, I have a question about that because, um, if you have a separate garage that isn't like, are we limiting this to, you know, one ADU? I think we need to be pretty specific with that so that you can still have a other buildings potentially on your lot, um, whether that's a shed or um, garage. So I, I think that would be a separate allowance altogether. Um, this is specific to number of accessory dwelling units per lot. Okay. And I just wanted to bring up that perhaps um, something, of, you know, some of those larger lots could have a detached ADU and then also could have like a basement ADU, which would be an attached. And we did do with the STRs we did, you could have one which was homeowner occupied and one that was not homeowner occupied. And so, um, so my suggestion would be that we do a, an allowed number of two, one detached and one attached. Uh, Ms. Hutchinson? I think one, period. That's what all the other cities have done. So that's what I think. Thanks. Mr. Stites? I think at some point your property then goes from your dwelling unit that you're trying to stay in forever to you're trying to make a bunch of money by packing a bunch of people into your own property. So I think one is probably enough. So, uh, Hoppy. Yeah, and, and just, you know, in the, in the um, memo, the, the AARP, one of their recommendations was to al allow for more than one ADU on larger lots in denser zones. So like two ADUs per single family lot, one attached and one detached was the AARP's suggestion, mm -hmm. um, along with the maximum of the 25 feet and um, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's why I brought that up. Okay, uh, I'd like to ask for a consensus uh, that we uh, limit one per lot, one ADU per lot limit. Okay, we have consensus on that. Yep. All right, uh, the last one is, uh, are we going to put a limit on the total number of ADUs, not per lot, but across the city or other restrictions? And all right, so I'd like to ask for a consensus that we are not going to limit the total number of ADUs. All right, consensus reached. Okay. Will we be able to allow motorhomes to be an ADU? No. And what, how would we not regulate that? Or what, would just in, in yeah, particular? So or? A question also came up regarding uh, tiny homes. Um, our, you know, we have a whole separate section on RVs and they're not allowed to be occupied occupied okay so that would not be absent an amendment to that section of the code those would not be allowed to be an ADU okay similarly with tiny homes we you you did in adopting 2018 building codes you adopted the uh, I'm not going to remember what appendix it was but the the tiny home appendix and so y you could do tiny homes in the city from a building code standpoint um, and and that makes basically gives some flexibility in terms of egress requirements from, um, from sleeping rooms and some of the size requirements that Scott mentioned. Uh, they can't be on wheels, right? So once okay. they have wheels, you know, they, they're, they're, 
not they're they're not allowed in our regulatory environment because they're considered RVEs. So can you jack them up, take the wheels off, and <laughs> they'd have to be have on a wheels? foundation. They potentially have to oh, have yeah. full utilities. But a, a tiny home not on wheels could potentially be an accessory dwelling unit as I, well. I agree. It, it could. Okay. So. Um, and then would the legislation um, be specific about what requirements would be minimum requirements in terms of um, uh, bathing and kitchen and those types of facilities? Yeah, so the regular building code has minimum size requirements in residential units for the size of living space, the size of uh, sleeping rooms, and um, you know, to the extent how, how many people can actually sleep in those sleeping quarters based on the size of the room. Uh, the tiny home is really a carve out that, that reduces some of those requirements. Mm -hmm. So we did adopt that appendix. So you would have some flexibility to create an ADU that's you know presumably detached that would be able to take advantage of those uh, reductions and some of those size requirements. Okay, Ms. Hutchinson? Thank you. Um, about the motor homes, okay, a lot of people are traveling now is it okay to have uh, people have company that <laughs> you know come from somewhere else and they have a motorhome and they pull in your driveway? I don't believe so. Or there's a time limit, like 72 hours or something. I, that man oh, do you I know? thought I thought it was <laughs> under camping. I think it's like 30 days before it has to move. Like you can camp. I, I, I not not I on a public street though. No, no, not yeah. on a in public street, but driveway. in someone's even, driveway. Even the driveway, I don't think you can. No. The the only carve out is that you can get a permit to park them on the street for a, a certain number of days, but yeah. they're still not allowed to be occupied. So are motor homes or trailers allowed to be parked just in driveways? Yes. And be seen? Yes, so long as they're on the proper um, parking surface. Mm -hmm. Can't just be on grass or dirt. It's got to be on um, pavement or rock or stone. Pavers. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ohm. So one question, was the, do you know what the historic reason why people were not allowed to be in an RV? Was it a life safety with winter or something to that effect or? Not allowed to occupy the RV? Yeah. What was the, at some point, city council decided that that shouldn't be allowed. I'm just wondering, was that based on, like, insulating factors, life safety? Um, I, I can't speak to it. I mean, it's been on the books for, yeah, I years, think, about yeah. 20 years at least. Okay. And let me circle back to our sort of a, a original topic. Um, We've kind of got a two-pronged bill, right? Being able to to bring uh, ADUs sort of into that are existing into compliance on some sort of a timetable, and then and then ultimately the uh, the regulations that we're proposing. So the legislation would have a scheme to bring the existing units into compliance. Okay. Is there further discussion that we need to have on this matter before we move to an, another one? And on. All right. Thank you very much. Good discussion. Is that does that give you does that give you what you need? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Excellente. So. All right. Let's go to uh, agenda item number three. We've gotten through two of them pretty pretty handily. Thank you. Um, this is uh, staff reports. Start with Mr. Gong. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this should be fairly quick, but um, we sent uh, an email to City Council, um, I believe last week, or a couple different emails. First, uh, an update on the COVID situation in Colorado, which if you looked at it or if you've been watching the news, you know it's really bad. Um, but then we sent a follow-up email. Um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and I spoke about what council would like to do um, with future meetings. Um, would you like to consider going back to virtual at least through maybe the holidays um, until we get our COVID numbers down or continue with um, in-person meetings with masks. Discuss. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Um, Oppie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm, I am fine to go either way. I'll do, I'll do whatever everybody else wants to do. So I'm, down, I'm okay with going.
virtual. I still have to bring myself to this bu building because my Wi-Fi is terrible, or if I bring myself to this building and you guys are in the room. So I'm good with either way. Ms. Hultine? Thank you. Uh, I am in favor of going virtual. Um, I, uh, I've been, uh, I haven't been, this is about as most cautious as I've been feeling about COVID since it hit. I know more people who are vaccinated who have caught COVID um, than I know. I know at least twice as many people who have caught COVID fully vaccinated uh, than have not. And I think with increased uh, indoorsness and the holidays, I think limiting exposure uh, both for ourselves and our community members, uh, I, I would fully support going to virtual format until we feel like it's, it's additional, dis conditions. additional discussion. Mr. Ohm. Thank you. Um, I, I'm kind of either way. If the majority really wants to go virtual, that's fine. Um, uh, I, I generally, you know, look at what the CDPHE is recommending. Um, I understand that, uh, 80, you know, it sounds like there's roughly a, an 81% of the infections are from non-vaccinated people. Um, so, I, you know, if the majority feels that we want to go, vir you know, virtual, that's fine. I, I won't, I won't have to wear the mask. So that, I guess that's a, that's an upside. Um, but uh, either way, thank you. Ms. Nosler back. Um, I just wanted to um, use this evening as an example of um, how it can work um, to keep moving forward the way that we have been. Um, I really appreciate us being able to meet and um, the entire council has been um, really, and staff, um, really staff has made it possible for us to feel safe when we're meeting in person. But I would say that um, in this time leading up to the holidays, as more people are gathering, um, whereas when we first discussed moving back to in person and if we should allow for people to, to zoom in, um, we, we were saying it, it needs to be some pretty extenuating circumstances that you're not just zooming in for any reason. I think we should maybe loosen the, um, the uh, you know, kind of culture around that right now. And um, for any council member that feels um, like they would rather stay home, we can do it virtually, but for those that would like to t attend in person, they can. Um, that's that's what I would like to see um, moving forward. Ms. Hoppy? I guess I just would also like to remind us that around that conversation, though, it was really important that everybody was like, it's really important that we're either all, all Zoom or all live. And so um, I, I would like to really keep that in mind also that if it's just, Lucy goosey and we don't know who's who's showing up in person we still have you know we have staff people that we have to consider like do they need to always have to show up in person and and maybe some of us show up maybe maybe one of us me shows up like so I think it needs to be all one way or the other right now I, I hear one one virtual two will go however anybody else wants to go and I think that we should just kind of vote and then decide how we want to do that or not not vote we should make a consensus mm -hmm. sorry study session and then see how, where we want to go with that Ms. Hutchinson I go for going virtual <laughs> but that's just because I read a lot and I'm very concerned about what's going on so um, it is true that people are getting COVID who've been vaccinated <coughs> so it's um, it is a concern for me, and as it gets colder, we don't have ventilation either. Don't open doors and things. Right. It's just a safety thing for me, and I'm the oldest one here. Thanks. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Ohm, Ms. Holteen, and then Ms. Weaver. Um, so uh, my last comment is just, if we're considering going virtual because of our concerns, 
do we need to extenuate that uh, mandate to the city, um, to our citizens uh, as well? Question for Mr. Gall. Are, are you, um, Council Member, are you speaking about the city facilities, not having the city hall open, basically, kind of thing? Or, or, or you I'm, mean, oh, I'm just saying, like, in mass, council meetings? I'm, I'm saying just, you know, if, if our concern is about our health and the health of our citizens, do yeah. we also need to consider the entire city a mask mandate? Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, and just if, if I can, if Council Member Dozman, it, we have a meeting, um, I believe tomorrow, with the governor's office um, and in the CDPHE, and the state may be considering, I'm not saying they're considering that, but they may be considering um, some statewide restrictions. I think, um, don't know what, and I think it's just an open discussion at this point. So um, I think we'll know more this week on what the state and maybe the health, I think the Jeffco Health also has a, a board meeting this week, sorry. Uh, I, I just say as a preference, I, I prefer to be in person. I think I get a lot more out of it. Um, uh, I feel there's a lot more engagement as far as like council members go. Uh, although we did have pretty good participation amongst residents online. Um, but I, I would agree that it's kind of like an all or nothing situation. But if we as the leaders within the city are saying that we don't feel comfortable meeting in person, um, I, are we going to extend that to our boards and commission meetings? Um, are we going to start shutting down um, some of our facilities and, and mandating masks again? Um, I, I can say, like, I, I think um, for most of us, we've all been vaccinated, and at some point, we're all getting our boosters. I know I just got mine, um, and we're all wearing masks. If if we maybe are meeting in this format, and I know that's hard with voting, but uh, I mean, we're we're all pretty widely spread out. So I, I would prefer to stay in person and, and maybe until state restrictions come out. Ms. Holtine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, one of the considerations that I'm thinking about, and I actually, just to be clear, I vastly prefer to meet in person. I feel like I get more out of the discussions. Um, but I'm also reminded, like, when we meet in person, there, you know, there's a whole host of staff and other support people who also uh, need to meet with us, too. So, you know, we have some flexibility, as Ms. Nossler Beck is demonstrating tonight, that we as counselors, if we opt out for some reason and decide to come virtual, we um, still have other staff members um, who might have young kids and vulnerable family members. So I'm just um, I'm sensitive to that. If we don't reach a consensus tonight to go virtual, um, I think it's, you know, we might find out pretty soon that it's a conversation we're having again very quickly. Um, part of why I wanted to bring it forward tonight is just being sensitive to the fact that we are going into the holiday season and we're going to be spending a lot more time with vulnerable family members. So if that's a consideration for council, um, this is a good time for us to address that. And if not, uh, we will be meeting again and we will probably know more in a week. So um, so I'll go ahead and ask the, for the consensus now. Um, I'm going to seek a consensus that we switch to virtual meetings. All right, so we do not have that consensus. Um, so we'll keep our ears open for other directives and when needed, we can revisit it. Uh, Ms. Weaver, I had you on the, on the call list. Oh, okay, well, we took the consensus, but okay. I was just gonna say that I'm happy to fair, do. Fair enough. Hmm. This all may change tomorrow. <laughs> so keep your, keep your ears open. That's it for me. Okay, uh, we will go to elected officials reports. Does anyone have a report uh, for us tonight? All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, we had a, a great meeting. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Ms. Powers and, uh, and our planning staff for being here. And if there's no more business, then we will stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>